Boy, I tell you, no coffee needed if you're an Indiana State fan. Wow, what a uh, in paradise last night. Quite the scene there as Indiana State gets the win. Pacers back in action tonight. Some news on Jim Ursay. We got it all this morning here on the Wake Up Call. Hanging out with you. He's Kevin Bowen. I'm Andy Sweeney. We have Corbin. Day three of Corbin. Hanging out with us here on the fan. 93.5, 107.5. The fan. Catch us online. 93.5, 107.5. You can stream there as well. The YouTube page is up and rolling. KB, a good morning to you, sir. How's everything going? Everything Everything is great. I did have to make an adjustment okay. to one of my favorite hats. You know, I, I rock the, the Indiana State hat on occasion here, <laughs> the baby blue. What did you put on it? You know, it says Larry Legend on the hat. Okay. It says, was it blurred? Larry Blurred. <laughs> I like that. For I, Mr. Robbie <laughs> Avila hitting oh, the game man. winning three that good for him. a minute to go last night. Remember the various nicknames? What? Cream? Cream Abdul Jabbar. Jabbar. Oh, correct? yeah. Larry Blurred. There's one more that Josh Hurts, Man, I know. You're right. There's Actually, there's one or two more of. that are really, really good that we need to look up. Yeah, good uh, for him. Nothing but net from Mr. Rex Specs there with a minute to go. Tied at 77 last night. A fun atmosphere. Certainly, you, you could feel that watching it. Uh, and, boy, if you are the Indiana Sports Corp, if you are the people that said, you know what, <laughs> NIT to Hinkle Fieldhouse, you could not be more thrilled no kidding. about this. It will be Holman Center East coming up on Tuesday night. And JMV at- doesn't even have to drive very far, guys. No, I mean, no. this is great Hell, for him, you got, right? you got to be doing the show from the West <laughs> Gym over he does. there at Hinkle Field I expect House. front row seats. Do you understand? Front row, middle, 50-yard line. He can sit in the bird's nest. I always like that view at Hinkle Field House, so... Uh, nice win from Indiana State last night. And, you know, th- they've gotten the opportunity here, Andy, not only to certainly extend their season, uh, but they've you know done it against power teams, or at least power conferences is probably the best way to put it. Uh, and beating a Big Ten team last night, being a Big 12 team, uh, they started off beating an American team in SMU. Uh, it's a really nice run for Josh Schertz. I think a lot of times, especially with a coach that in all likelihood will not be there next year, you're kind of curious how the team will react. Indiana State's handled it. Very, very well. 85-81 winners last night with Edron James in the building well, he, to watch his son. Yeah, he, here's here's the thing. Uh, we were talking about this, and we'll move on. Pacers tonight. Pacers-Bulls is a huge matchup. NFL news, uh, Jim Ursay news, Chris Ballard spoke with the media yesterday. We'll dive into all of it. By the way, we should set today's show up. I mean, it's a monster, is it not? Like, low-key, Rick Carlisle going to join us coming up at 8 o'clock. Obviously, yesterday, uh, our normal Tuesday spots with him, they were traveling after the West Coast game, getting into Chicago. So, Carlisle will join us coming up at 8 o'clock. Stephen Holder will join us. Us. Is he now? Is he still in Orlando, to, or did he get out of town last yeah, night? I don't know when he left, but did he yeah, get he'll out of town. Owners meetings with us coming up at eight thirty. Yeah, he'll be at eight thirty. Brian Cardinal, Purdue great, joining us at nine fifteen, and then for the first time ever, Will Carroll. Yes, usually our injury expert, KB tells me is a big baseball guy. Big baseball. Uh, okay, guy. well, usually when we have him on, something horrific has happened on the field. <laughs> okay, so or every, court I mean, or court. Every time we've had him on, it's been like, okay, is the season over? So uh, maybe we can alter our questions just a little bit. But I will say that it's Thursday, right? I mean, that, I mean, tomorrow's kind of the big opening uh, day. So, yeah, I, absolutely. I know we have the games no. in Korea, but now nah, yes. that's not opening day. Uh, tomorrow, you that's will get, not opening day. No, it is not. That's the fake opening day. You'll get the Red Legs at home as always, four ten against the Nationals. Cubs on the road at the Rangers. There, Cardinals at Dodgers. Trying to cover all of our local audiences here as uh, opening day gets underway. Yeah, White we, Sox are at home tomorrow. Get, uh, people don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll talk for Mark Dighton here well, as he's in Disney or wherever the people hell he's at. caring once, once it's like Earth Day. <laughs> That's a great point. Go ahead, Corbin. You got something. Go uh, ahead. I know somebody who cares. Do you oh, care? Right over are you here, a White yeah. Sox fan? I'm not a White Sox fan, no. Fandom but. is where, Corbin? <laughs> he, just, he just has the under. Yeah. Okay, Where's, there it is. He's my, got the under. My fandom lies with the Atlanta Braves. Ooh. Team of the regular okay. season. Okay, okay. the yeah, team yeah. of the regular season. Team of the regular season is an accurate way to put it there. D- they did win not too long ago. So so anyway, we have all that. But Indiana State has done the thing, and we were laughing about it before the show. It's like if if, if I was faced with the NIT, I would go more of the way of IU instead of Indiana State. But they are locked in. They know their coach is leaving. They'll probably take a player or two along with them. And they're playing their ass off, so good for them. And – We should also mention, you know, obviously a loaded guest list today. I do want to make sure uh, we keep you guys up 
to date on tomorrow. Rick Venturi is going to join us early tomorrow. We're going to have Coach Venturi on 7.30 and 8 o'clock. We'll go back-to-back segments with him for those curious you know, it, what the reason is behind that. Tomorrow is the 40th year anniversary of the Colts moving from Baltimore to Indianapolis. Um, and Rick Venturi has some unbelievable, literally boots on the ground stories from that move. So again, he's going to join us, talk a little bit of the history, of course, at 730. And then at 8 o'clock, we'll get more to present day stuff. We'll ask him about uh, how the Colts have operated this offseason. Uh, I know he's down in the bunker there in Florida. Uh, dissecting the draft film. He's got some prospects he loves, the Morse Reservoir All-Stars, as he would call them, uh, coming up here as we are less than a month away from the draft, which is kind of crazy as we start to shift gears a little bit in the month of April. And we'll continue to have our Purdue guests here throughout the week. Did you see that line has climbed just a little? Five and a half now for the Boilermakers as they are a favorite Okay, over Gonzaga. So the immediate money came in on Purdue and seemingly so a pretty good amount of it. A little bit of backing okay. for the Purdue Boilermakers. At some point today, I do want to go back to, you know, Matt Painter laid out three keys to get to Phoenix. You know, when he was asked the question, I don't know if he initially loved the idea of it, but then he eventually gave an answer at the start of the tournament. All right, here are three keys that we've got to achieve to get to the final four. Um, we'll look back on week one, or I should say the first weekend of the tournament, and see how Purdue did in handling those. But two days away, two more sleeps, Purdue fans, before you watch your boilers in the Sweet 16 against the Zag. Yeah, and if you're a Pacer fan tonight, that'll get you through, won't it? I mean, last night was you had to watch your favorite show with the wife. Wasn't that last night, Tuesday, if you weren't we interested in Indiana swing, State? the uh the golf Netflix series. Oh, God, you made your wife watch. She loves it. <laughs> Does she? The because pettiness it, between the golfers? She loves the pettiness. She loves the wives I was about to say, do, do they show the golfer wives? They did. Okay, um, Corbin, never mind. We're going to have to watch this. Now, it, she also just loves a little bit of, like, it, it's finally some personality. You know, it's not just like oh, 100. It's not. It's 100, not golf. 178 yards. Roy McIlroy's in the seven iron golf. here, and he needs a high cut. So she appreciates that. And, and okay. You know, uh, shout out to Indy Zone, and we've had him on before, of course. Last night, you got a little Michael Grady on TNT. Okay. Michael Grady, the voice of the Timberwolves, he slid into the big chair there for TNT. Kings and Mavs. Unfortunately, that was not a very close game for uh, MG to call, but. Uh, the star, star in the making, obviously, Indy Zone. Uh, very proud of everything that he has continued to accomplish and will continue to accomplish. I think a lot of the normal TNT folk, uh, they're NCAA tournament you know, bound right now. So Michael Grady getting a little national love last night in uh, the play-by-play voice for that TNT Yeah, game. and uh, I was told when I started, we carry on his tradition by continuing the pop quiz. Wasn't the pop <laughs> quiz created by him 12 years ago around here at the fan, if I'm not mistaken? I believe there is a lot of accuracy <laughs> okay. to that. that. So thank you to MG That's what that. I thought. Uh, you know, I wanted to bring up a couple things. You know, coming up at 7.30, um, a little bit of, you know, Pat, Pat McAfee had a little bit of news yesterday. Just a short clip. We'll play uh, an update on Jim Irsay. Several things to Chris Ballard. Now, there was no Chris Ballard sound out there. You know, we had a ton yesterday of Shane Steichen, but some quotes coming out about Chris Ballard. And I just, I feel like the wrong narrative, KB, the wrong question slash narrative is kind of being asked of, uh, of Chris Ballard yesterday, and he talked about it, and I actually disagreed with a couple things that he said. So I wanted to dive into that, but, you know, tonight, you know, usually we would sit here and not make such a big deal about this, but every one of these games counts, and tonight you have the Pacers who are 3-1 and one on this road trip, and we'll talk with Carlisle coming at, uh, up at 8 o'clock, and, you know, they have a chance – Go beat Chicago, who has lost, what, three in a row at this point? I mean, Chicago, we know, is very much a, they're the nine seed. They could end up being the 10, probably the nine. But you wake up this morning, and the Miami Heat lost last night at home to the Golden State Warriors. And tonight, you play a team that, good God, you should be focused on and you should want revenge on, quite frankly, in the Chicago Bulls. But you wake up today and you're a Pacer fan. You're you're now two and a half games. No, excuse me, a game and a half ahead of the Miami Heat. And I feel like that's the biggest distance you've had between the six and seven seed. 
I, I, I don't know since when, KB. It seems like quite a while. It's been like a half game up to a game, and now it's a game and a half. And with nine games to play, a lot of teams, like I know Miami has 10 games left on their schedule. Boy, I am looking at it saying, like, like now I feel like you got to be the sixth seed. Like, you got to be the sixth seed. And then I heard JMV talk about it yesterday with, uh, with Atlas Golden. You know, he thinks, hey, the Orlando Magic right now, you know, th- there's a chance they continue to move up in the standings. You could actually face Orlando, perhaps. Uh, it might still be Cleveland. But for me, where the Pacers are, how they're playing, if they were to lose tonight, boy, I, I think it would be potentially the most disappointing loss of the season. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to Or at go least th- in the top three or yeah. four, would it not? I'm not going to go there. Final game of a road trip. They've already won three games. They're a little banged up. Aaron Neesmith and TJ McConnell, both questionable. But I'll, I'll, I'll make kind of a lazy son of two teacher analogy to it. There's been a couple of moments over the last few months, Andy, where like the Pacers have turned in their assignment and they've gotten a nice grade on it. Good job. You did what you needed to do. I think tonight it's a little bit of like, can you just, can you do the extra credit? Right. Can you go above and beyond just a little a bit? Just a little bit more. Yeah, right. I, I'm just asking a little bit more. And again, the opponent on paper, it call, I mean, the Pacers are favored on the road. Like it, 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 on paper, you should, I think, win this game. But at the same time, if you would have told me at the start of the road trip, they would won, they would win three games and three very convincing wins so far. Uh, they've done what they've needed to do. Now it's like, all right, go above and beyond because it might sound like an arbitrary number a little bit, but if you win tonight, Andy, that's four of five. You know, they have not had many four of five stretches in the last couple of months. I think there's only been one since really early January, and obviously you could point to Halliburton's injury, uh, which was the second week of January, as, as a reason for that. But this is the opportunity to, and you laid out the standings there, to try and create a little bit of separation because if you still let Miami hang around a week from Sunday when Miami's in your building, that's the game of the year. Right. That is the decides the tiebreaker for the head to head between those two opponents. Right now, you just said a game and a half up on the Heat. That is the difference between seven game series and a play in against potentially Joel Embiid in round one. Like you don't you don't want to have the play in game if Embiid is back. Um, I know the Sixers are reeling, but all of a sudden, if you lose that, now you're playing for your season in that second play-in game. So I do think it is an opportunity for the Pacers tonight to, again, just kind of take that further step. They've they've gotten to the finish line uh, several different times throughout recent weeks here of winning two of three, winning, what, three of four, something like that. Now it's, okay, go a little further. Uh, we'll see if there's any ups, uh, updates on Aaron D. Smith when Rick Carlisle does join us as he missed that went over the Lakers the other night. There was a Chris Ballard item shared by Stephen Holder who's going to join us in a little over an hour that I could not agree with more. I know I strongly disagreed with some of those comments uh, earlier in the week and shared those yesterday, but there was something that he has mentioned. and It's probably come up a couple of times since the season's ended, but it's an attribute to this Colts team in 2023 or 2024 that I cannot agree with more so we'll hit on that as well uh with the news in bloomington yesterday that's what seven scholarships officially open for mike woodson with cleo Ware declaring for the draft does that sound right yeah cleo Ware uh, declares for the draft that's not a surprise at all you knew that was going to happen I- i'll say it again with mike woodson well no with all the negativity a guy like Khalil Ware, you put on your mantle and you say, this guy was nothing at Oregon. It's a great He's story. He's a first-round draft pick yeah, right yeah. now. And credit to Mike Woodson. Credit to Khalil Ware as well. Um, he had a great season. Look in the mirror moment, and he is, in my opinion, earned to be selected in the first round here coming up later this offseason. Uh, of those seven openings, I know so much of it is portal, portal, portal. I think you've got to try and dip into the high school ranks here in the late, late, you know, period, and try to get one one to two guys. You know, you, you, you need some foundational elements that you grow with. I know the portal could offer some multi-year guys. Um, sometimes, you know, teams, Butler's being one here locally that's elected to take that route. But still, I think you need some sort of kind of the homegrown talent. And, again, I mean, whether it was McKenzie and Baco last year, I want to say Jalen hood Shafino is maybe a similar one. Tamar Bates, if you want to go back a little bit later. You do find it, you know, some decommits from, you know, high school recruits of coaches that have moved on, and for whatever whatever reason, maybe they're not following that coach 
to the next stop. I do think that's important for Indiana to try and tap into here as they reconstruct a roster really like no other uh, in over half of their scholarships needing to be. Filled. Yeah, and the guys that, I mean, listen, the guys that they get are going to have to be, you know, they're going to have to be top 25-ish kids. Now, they do have, he's a wing. Don't know too much about him. Uh, he, they do have Bryson Tucker, who is visiting them. I think that came out yesterday. Uh, Bryson Tucker offered by, it's going to be soon, Indiana, Illinois, Georgetown, Duke, Kansas. Sounds like a character in among, Saved by the Bell. <laughs> among others. So he is a name to watch out there. He is a five-star, depending on, of course, if you're looking at all three your rivals. Or Remember when we had Scout back in the day, oh, KB? I miss Scout. It was kind of a good rivalry. Uh, rivals versus oh, Scout, It was right? a great rivalry between yeah. the two. It was Duke North Carolina, IU, Purdue. That's exactly what it was. Uh, but So Bryson Tucker, about a top 20, top 25, 26, 7-ish kid. Uh, he'll be visiting. Also, you I don't know if you've done this or not, but thank God to, to our good friend Tony Adrania. Have you seen what he's done? He has... Now, he's only doing this on the portal, so I'm not calling you out, Tony. It'd be nice if you threw in some high school stuff, but we can get that elsewhere. He has IUPortalTracker.com. He is a sick human being, but he is kind of doing our work for us <laughs> by everyone that God bless that, everyone man. that they've contacted, everyone that they've zoomed with, everyone that they're uh, visit, you know, that has visited or will visit. He's got the visit dates. Like I'll give Tony you Tony is the drug get, for he, IU no, Nation. He's, he's but it's hey, and he's one of the nicest human no, beings I but know. But it's by the it's way. it's great. I mean, good for him. IUPortalTracker.com. If you want to look that up, I'll give you a for instance before we move on. Leland Walker. You may say, who's that? Oh, the pride of North Central. <laughs> Boom. There you go. Eastern Kentucky. He's a scoring point guard. He'll be visiting on April first. L- so how about that. that? Yeah. Happy April Fools, right there <laughs> from a portal standpoint. <laughs> uh, we'll keep you updated on everything. It was a busy night, certainly in Terre Haute. Uh, busy guest line for us. Rick Carlisle, 8. Stephen Holder, 8.30. Brian Cardinal. I think Carson Cunningham threw, threw custodian at him yesterday. I've always thought janitor. But okay, thank you. Whatever works thank for you. Brian Cardinal. Will Carroll as baseball opening day is tomorrow. Loaded show here on this Wednesday morning. Thank you for spending with us. It is the wake-up call.
Michael Fieldhouse, April 1st and 3rd. Yeah, I tell you what, the NIT on the men's side is really picking up. You saw it last night in Paradise. The Holman Center was rocking over 9,000 people. Boy, I tell you, it looked like, I mean, it looked like a tournament game. It, it looked like a, like a home game. It, this is a lot of fun last night watching that game. Uh, the end was obviously fantastic. 85-81, your final. Indiana State moves to the finals of the NIT. I should say the final four of the NIT right down the road here at Hinkle as they beat Cincinnati last night. Post game, Josh Shirts happy with the win. We talked a lot about all the deposits we made all year. You know, come and do in this game. This is going to be, you know, you know, a kind of whatever's whatever is necessary type game, and that was going to be what was required. Some extraordinary efforts, and I thought we got extraordinary efforts uh, up and down the roster. Could not be prouder of these guys, and of course, uh, you know, Robbie, as he's done, uh, you know, so many times, uh, you know, with a with a monster, you know, three to 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 kind of you know give us some separation there. And that three has me altering my hats on this Wednesday morning. It usually says Larry Legend uh, with my very mediocre to awful handwriting. <laughs> I have now changed it to Larry Blurred, if you're looking on the YouTube chat. Larry Nerd, I think, is what some other people have referenced, <laughs> Mr. Robbie. Of the, uh, he hit the Steph, three last Steph night. Steph Blurry. There you go. I like that as well. 77-77 <laughs> at the top of the key. The Rex Specs hits one there. They take the lead, and they hold on 85-81. Honestly, the committee should have let Indiana State in just so the whole nation could see their great jerseys. They have the best jerseys in college basketball. Okay, you're willing to say that? Okay, I, I have no problem with that. Sure. The baby blue oh, yeah, the, the baby state blue is of fantastic. Indiana for the eye. I absolutely love it there. Uh, and we'll see who they face coming up at the NIT. That's Hinkle Fieldhouse. That is Tuesday in Thursday, the Final Four and Championship there. Again, Hinkle hosting the NIT Finals this year. Georgia, we know, is one of the other teams. They beat Ohio State. We'll see the final two teams to round out um, the NIT coming up later tonight. I did think Josh Shirts, he shared this story with John, I want to say it was last week, Andy. He explained just, like, the heartbroken nature that his team had on Selection Sunday of just, like, they really thought they were getting in. Shirt said he kind of had a feeling they wouldn't get in, but he, you know, for the players, they really felt like they were going to get in. And from a motivational tactic, what he decided to do was he reached out to the parents of his players, mm. had them all send in a video explaining why these guys got started in the game of basketball, how they fell in love with basketball. I'm always curious, like NIT, where you know is the motivational, you know unanimous throughout a roster what is it like thought that was kind of a cool way to get his guys reset lock in uh and they've now won obviously their first three games here in the nit and again the final four for that coming up tuesday night i think it'll be a sea of baby blue inside of hinkle Fieldhouse. i mean the they, they they have the biggest reason to to not want to play out of anybody right just about anyone in, in the entire nit don't you feel that way I mean, like St. John's, they just decided they weren't going to play. Indiana decided they're not going to play. I'm not picking on those two, but those are the first two that came to mind. And St. John's, I know, felt like, you know, they were ripped off. Indiana State felt like they were ripped off. They played. The coach may leave. The roster. I mean, this is the last ride for these guys. This roster is not going to be the same next year. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just not. Right. It's the unfortunate nature of a mid-major that's accomplished a lot. And Josh Schertz's name, of course, very hot right now in the coaching circle. So shout out to the trees. Advancing to the final four of the NIT. All right, Pacers final. How about this? The final eight o'clock tip of the year. It's Eastern time zone from here on out for the Pacers. They are in Chicago to round out this five game road trip. Rick Carlisle going to join us here in 30. The Bulls have had the Pacers number this season. Now they've lost three in a row, Chicago. Uh, they've been involved in tons and tons of clutch games this season. Obviously, the Pacers have felt it with DeMar DeRozan a couple of weeks ago. Of note, a little bit of tiebreaker action up for grabs. If the Pacers win this, uh, they'll actually clinch the tiebreaker over Cleveland based off divisional record. Uh, but if you look at the standings right now, uh, Orlando right above them has the tiebreaker, and Miami could have the tiebreaker over Indiana depending on what happens in their final matchup here a week from Sunday. So you know, the Pacers have so many head-to-head tiebreakers, but not with the teams right next to them in the standings. So that is something to keep an eye on here over the final nine games. Again, T.J. McConnell, ankle, Aaron Neesmith, knee, both questionable. Alex Caruso, who hit some big shots against the Pacers a few weeks ago, he is also questionable for tonight. Pacers favored by three and a half. 
Just one more thing on that. I mean, don't don't you feel like I, I guess this is what I was trying to get at earlier. Don't you feel like if they're the sixth seed, at least it makes you feel different about what they did this season than if they drop into the play in. It yeah. do, it does mean I know it's only it might only be a half game. At the end, only it might be a game or a half game or whatever it is that's gonna separate. But I mean, to me it would it, it would be a it would be more of a regular season accomplishment than if they're the seven or eight seed. Well, and I know that, yeah, and again, at the start of the year, my expectations were five or six seed and 45 wins. So that would check, you know, that box. Also, and they've had Milwaukee's number this season, but, you know, if you're the one, you're getting, if you're the eight, you're getting Boston as a one. If you're the seven, you're getting Milwaukee as a two. If you're the six, you're getting an unproven, banged up Cleveland team in all likelihood. Or, or, or maybe Cleveland, I guess. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. you know, it could be the it's Knicks. It's possible, could yeah. Could be the Magic. Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious on paper, but, you know, who would you want to play out of those three teams? You'd want to play a banged-up, unproven Cleveland team in the playoffs as well. So I think that adds to it on top of that. Yeah, a couple NFL notes. Uh, Legereus Sneed signing his contract. Did you see that with the Tennessee Titans? He got a four. You know, we talked a lot about him. He got a four-year deal worth 76.4 mil. Uh, that was good for 50 five mil guaranteed and just to throw this out as well if you know the name Tredavious White we talked about him uh, as well you know many years many good years uh, at Buffalo was one of the good young corners in the game really the last several seasons has just missed time he missed 28 games the last three years he did sign an 8.5 mil one year deal with the uh, with the uh, Los Angeles Rams yesterday that contract could get up to 10 mil so uh, we talked about you know Tredavious White a couple days ago Another corner option for the Colts. He's officially off the board. The longer it goes, does that mean more of a chance at a reunion for the Colts and Julian Blackman? We'll hit on that. Some Chris Ballard-related comments. Actually, something I agree with Ballard on. I know Andy's got a Ballard thought coming up on the other side. And how has Purdue achieved the Matt Painter keys to the Final Four so far? We'll hit on that. Rick Carlisle in 30. It is the wake-up call, 93.5 on 7.5, the fan. The IHSAA Boys Basketball State Finals. Coverage Saturday morning at 11.
right, so we're back at it here. DriveHuber.com studios. KB and Andy, wake up call. A huge show today. Rick Carlisle, 8 o'clock. Reminder, Stephen Holder. It's the wake up call. We'll move, we'll move Stephen back to 8.30 or so. Brian Cardinal at 9.15. So we are loaded today. A little bit of Purdue, a little bit of Colts, a little bit of Pacers. Pacers in action tonight. 8 o'clock, our coverage here on the fan beginning uh, at 7.30. I wanted to... to, to you know, as as a jumping off point, um, Jim Mercer's daughter, Kaylin, was on with Pat McAfee. That was yesterday, right? With Pat McAfee yesterday. He's on the road there in Florida uh, at the meetings. And so, obviously, his relationship with the Ursay family. Uh, and she gave an update on Jim Mercer. And then Chris Ballard said something that KB actually agree Corbin can you believe this he actually agrees with freaking Bowen agree okay? wholeheartedly, uh, cannot wholeheartedly agree more with. okay so we'll dive into that but first uh he uh, she was asked about hey how's pops doing how's Jim doing here's that conversation good he's 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 doing better he's not here obviously because he's still recovering um but everyone's been just so kind and gracious and and checking on him asking about him and I heard it was not good Right? Is that accurate? Your dad's a tough dude. Though, he obviously. is a tough dude. Um, and I think, you know, of course, I'm not going, going to specifics about his medical condition. He can answer those questions for himself. But, um, you know, it's going to be a long road for him. But he's um, getting better every day. So, you know, throughout this process, Andy, I've said this week is the first time really in the offseason Ursay makes a public appearance. Normally, you know, it, it's at these league meetings, the owners meetings, however you want to call them. Um, down in Florida this year. So he did not, of course, make that public appearance. The next time typically is Saturday of the draft. So if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it's one month from today. I think it's April 27th is that Saturday, the final day of the draft. He usually pops into the media room at the Colts Complex, you know, chats with us about you know the state of the offseason, the draft, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be the next time to kind of keep an eye out for it. Um, so owners meetings for the Colts wrapped up again. Stephen Holder going to join us here uh, at 830. We you know, talked a little bit about it yesterday from a Ballard standpoint. I know there's something that you wanted to mention, but one thing that Chris did say yesterday that I could not agree with more is the high end optimism on the duo of Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor as a run threat. Right. Uh, you right. know, when you think back to what, like, Lamar Jackson has had next to him in Baltimore, you know, they, they, good backs. Uh, I wouldn't say great backs. Um, I wouldn't say they've had, like, mainstays there. You know, injuries have, have probably played into it a little bit for Baltimore. But, I mean, think about Jonathan Taylor next to Richardson. Jonathan Taylor led the league in rushing a couple years ago. I mean, watch that Houston game again. I, in my opinion, that was the – I think it's the best game of Jonathan Taylor's career. He was tough the moment. and he carried the team. And that's with Gardner Minshew yep. next to him. And, you know, go back, and I know we've done this before, but go back to the first Tennessee game. Actually, it's a game Richardson gets hurt uh, at Lucas Oil Stadium and the Zach Moss 50-60 yard touchdown run. And when you watch that play and watch the Tennessee defenders and how occupied and worried they are about Anthony Richardson keeping the football on that read option, on that zone read, it, it, it's exactly the element that, again, will only grow with Jonathan Taylor's speed and home run ability. Because the thing about Taylor is that's different than Zach Moss. You know, Taylor turns four into 40. And, and, and that second level, four, three, 40 yard dash speed, that element to the Colts offense next year should be extremely dynamic with Richardson and Taylor back there. And remember, we only saw it for what? One snap, two snaps, whatever the total was. Those two playing together. I think it was. Th- I think it was three plays, wasn't it? I mean, it was very I thought small. I heard that stat that it was just three plays. I thought Steven said that at some point with JMV or Jake. Yeah. So again, and I laid it out <laughs> yesterday. I have plenty of questions. Sure. About how the Colts have decided to go team run it back, but there is no doubt in my mind that instantaneously, Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson in the backfield should give the Colts one of the more dynamic run threats, uh, QB running back run threats, however you want to describe. Uh, that that ability in the entire NFL. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. I, I think with that, I'm really you know I'm I'm trying here. I, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to be sympathetic, if you will, KB, to both sides of the argument here because I mean, don't you feel like for all of the shortcomings 
if you're a Colts fan, and I think that's what it comes down to. It comes down to that Chris Ballard hasn't won anything here. His arguments, part of his arguments, especially when you mention, hey, guys, we didn't have Anthony Richardson. Hey, guys, you know, Jonathan Taylor with the contract and multiple injuries. There weren't many games, you know, and then, you know, when they're bringing him back at the beginning of the year, it was very much he was sharing time, right, with two or three guys back there at the running back position. So it's like you kind of got you kind of got the JT that you're used to for kind of a half a season, you know, something like that. So it's like, hey, AR is going to be back. Everyone knows the system, Jonathan Taylor. You know, you start to you start to dream and you start to believe these narratives. And I do think what you're saying and what Chris Ballard and Shane Steichen said this week there in Florida absolutely rings true. It's just right now the fans, and you would agree with this, would you not? The fans are in such a prove-it mode with him that even a, hey, Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson running the football is met with, I don't know if it's skepticism, but it's not met with the same zest and vigor as Chris Ballard is trying well, to sell. Sure, and I guess it doesn't all have to be black and white. It doesn't all have to be every single move that Chris Ballard makes is totally idiotic, and it doesn't have to be every single move that Chris Ballard makes is right. is genius great, and build right. a statue outside of you know Chatham Hill. Like it, it's no, it, it it it's not that. It is um it, it you can have different thoughts about the variety of moves. Um, that the Colts are making, you know, again, I would disagree with, as of now on paper, it looks like you're going to have the same 22 starters. And obviously, you know, some injured guys will rise into starting roles, but, you know, Joe Flacco and Raekwon Davis were not brought here to start. So that's what it's looking like right now. We'll see how corner and safety plays out. Again, I, I kind of thought this before yesterday, and it does sound like, you know, Julian Blackman is still on the table for the Colts. The longer it goes, I feel like the rest of the NFL is going to tell Julian Blackman, hey, man, that safety market that you think should be there for you right. is not there. Right. And the Colts have had this happen. The Colts have let guys they like hit the open market, see what's out there, and then eventually – they do come back. so And he's visited good places. I mean, Buffalo needs tons of secondary help. Uh, the 49ers obviously right, are right. a very good organization. So if you go there, you know you're playing in the postseason uh, as well. Just one quick Ballard thing before we move on. I know you have a thought on Purdue as well as – I mean, if I'm a Purdue fan, I'm just, I'm just going through my skin right now wanting to play this game on Friday – I, I was reading a lot of quotes, and again, there wasn't any sound or video from yesterday and Chris Ballard and everything, so I'm I'm reading the quotes, and it's funny, you said before we came on the air, hope you don't mind me saying, that you were reading a lot of the same quotes from Ballard, how he had confidence in his young corners, and again, a lot of fans probably disagree with that, like, hey, that's fine, there's young corners, but we need a couple guys that have played some NFL games and everything else, and so he talked about the corners, and then obviously he was asked, I'm sure, by Steven holder who will join us at 8 30 and others about you know the narrative of running it back signing your free agents and not signing anyone outside of the building you mentioned Raekwon Davis you mentioned Joe Flacco and that's about it and I I, I don't I, this is for me now I understand the conversation but I I don't want only that to be the conversation with Colts free agency and here's what I mean it's almost like letting Ballard a little bit off the hook because when you bring up, hey, Ballard, you, you haven't, I'm just, you know, fans and media, when they ask these questions, hey, Chris, you, you didn't go out and get guys from, uh, you know, free agents who were on other teams. You didn't go outside your building. He can easily respond to you by, well, I mean, Kenny Moore is, we, we put a lot of money into Kenny Moore. Kenny Moore is a great slot corner. Who else was out there that was, you know, if we lose him and he used the V word void yesterday, did Ballard. If we didn't sign Kenny Moore, there's a void. If we didn't I sign Grover, where well, you're going. Well, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Gosh. I was up in the air a little bit. If you don't have Grover Stewart, there's a void. And I would agree with him. On those things. But to me, the conversation isn't only about did you go outside your building and bring in guys? The conversation is did you get better? That's the conversation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Did you get better this offseason to where you feel like you're that playoff team? And fans want to be sold on something new that can 
uh, inject a- excitement, and Ballard is selling the opposite. He is selling, ah, the young corners are going to grow up. He's selling, ah, the injured quarterback's going to be back, and he's going to be dynamic. He's selling, wow, can you imagine him and JT in the backfield running the ball? And all those things are fine, but the question I would have for Ballard is, from the end of the season to now, did you get better? And that might be unfair. You haven't had the draft yet. Free agency. You know, Blackman could be back. You could go get a couple corners. And here in a few weeks, in a month, the answer could be yes, you did. But right now, you feel like there are teams that got better. You feel like the Titans and the Texans got better through free agency. And that... I think Colts fans were hoping that they could answer today as we sit here on March the 27th, KB, that they could answer the question, yes, we did get better. Uh, And that might be unfair because he believes bringing in, you know, keeping your same guys, but he very much shot par, I feel like, and fans wanted, if not an eagle, they at least wanted a birdie this offseason. I don't have have a golf analogy and a V word on your bingo card here (laughs) at 740. Does does that make sense? It's easy for Ballard to combat. I understand where you're coming. From. With yeah. hey, we re-signed good players here, guys. Don't diss Grover Stewart, but that's not the question. The question is, did you get better? And I don't know. And right now, the answer to that is no. You probably, you probably are a lot of who you were last season. You know, Ballard had the quote down there, and again, we'll chat with Stephen Holder about this in a bit. Different doesn't mean better. Um, you know, when Shane Sykin describes it, you know, I believe in continuity and consistency, and, and like I hear that, I just don't think it's the most ringing endorsement when. You know, for seven years, you've largely run it back with 18 to 19 starters every year. That's been kind of the mode of operation for the Colts. Uh, You could even say some years they had more starters that they ran it back with. And and what have the results been? The results have been a guy very fortunate to still be having a job, frankly, going into year eight as a GM. You know, 95% of GMs are fired by now with Chris Bauer's resume. Um, To me, I look at it and think some injection of life is needed. And guys that come from different buildings, guys that have different resumes, I think that is should be welcomed. Um, you know, you, you there are quality players on this football team. I you said that routinely. I think they've re-signed some quality football players. Absolutely. But just because you've re-signed them doesn't mean that that all of a sudden ties your hands behind your back to do nothing more this off season. And sometimes you've got to make some difficult decisions and say, all right, do we let a Grover Stewart walk? And then all of a sudden, the A money we're paying Grover Stewart is now B minus money we're paying to fill that defensive tackle spot. And now we take that money that's in between Grover and let's just use Raekwon Davis, for example. And now we use that and go try and bolster maybe more of a premium position. That's that's where I would play a little bit of devil's advocate to how they've operated. This has just been standard procedure, frankly, right. for, it, it happened, for the Ballard era. It, it, it happened just like every fan said. They said, Andy, this is exactly what's going to happen, and it's happened. And you know what? He it, – it, it'll be a great question for Steven, but by all accounts, he had a thought, we're going to do something different this offseason. Again, I mean, I asked him the very question two and a half months ago. On paper, you could easily just run it back by re-signing these top three or four guys. Right. And I asked that saying – I didn't say it to him, but in my mind, I'm like, that's how you usually operate. Are you going to do that? And if you do that, does that hamstring you on what else you can do? And he didn't go down that path then. And that leads me to think, and again, Steven reported yesterday, like they offered more for Daniil Hunter than Houston. Daniil Hunter ended up choosing to go with Houston, the hometown team, for him. So, you know, that I I think there was a part in the offseason where it's like, let's try something different. And then when it didn't work, it just didn't work Hunter out. Right. And then Sneed, whatever, they didn't feel like he was worth the value. Sneed's probably a different story than Hunter. Then that's when they've quickly pivoted and said, no, we're going to go full on resign. I think you could find a happy medium between those two areas and not just say, Outside our building or inside our building, it's either or. No, I think you can marry the two. Yeah, that's what I guess. That's what I was trying a to say. There. And, and there's I, different questions out there than just go get somebody who played, you know, last year in Atlanta or New York or Buffalo. And now the thought is like, oh, well, they'll just draft a corner at 15. Well, I, I, I don't want to force a need with the first pick. Like uh, to me, you know, who knows what the board's going to look like? Do you see Matt Miller at ESPN? 15. 
He just put his, you know, Matt Miller, good yeah, uh, NFL uh, ESPN draft analyst. He just put his mock out again. And, of course, now everyone's got everyone trading in the top four or five picks, you know, to go up and get J.J. McCarthy or whatever it may be. He has them. Now, this is the first time I've seen this position put with the Colts. Matt Miller has them taking defensive tackle from Texas, Byron Murphy the second. He's got it out there. Says general manager Chris Ballard could look at receivers or corners, but favoring the value of the draft's top defensive tackle would be typical Chris Ballard. And then talks about how much of a beast Murphy is. 6'1", 310 pounds interior defensive tackle. Colts fans would universally cry at that. (laughs) Nothing against the Murphy man, but more against the position at 15 there. Again, right now it looks like you got to force a need. And that to me is just not the path you want to explore especially when you have a pick as high as they do in round one. All right, more on this again. Stephen Holder in about a half hour. How have Purdue? How has Purdue checked the three keys that Matt Painter laid out for them uh, b- leading into the tournament? We'll touch on that at some point. On the other side, it is Rick Carlisle. A day later than usual, the Pacers head coach from Chicago joins us next. Query and Company. Michael Pittman Jr. is our guest. What amongst...
Tom Studios, wake up call, KB and Andy right here on the fan. Reminder, coming up in about a half an hour, Stephen Holder, ESPN, he'll join us. We'll talk some Colts with him. And then Purdue great Brian Cardinal will get to the uh, we'll get to the bottom. Is it the janitor or the custodian? We'll talk with him coming up at 9.15. It's a day late, but boy, it's sure good to talk with uh, Pacers head coach Rick Carlisle after some wins. And that's what we're doing right now as we head on out to the Payless Liquors Hotline. Uh, coach, good morning there. In Chicago, hoping tonight to make it four and one on this road trip, three and one right now. Uh, I, just, I I've loved the way you guys have played for the most part. What have you liked about uh, this mini road trip where you're three and one? If you beat Chicago tonight, would be four and one, and boy, that would be a that would be a, that'd be a nice thing, would it not? Well, the breaking news here is that you got Cardinal coming on, who's a <laughs> former member of uh, one of my teams in Dallas, and uh, you got to ask him about the 2011 Finals Game Six, which was the the clinching game, and um, he was a he was a major part of a championship being won. As in the first quarter, um, Dirk Nowitzki got two fouls of like the first five minutes. And at the time, we were, um, I think we were down five points. And, you know, what had happened in the series was because, because of the matchups, because of defensive matchups, as, as the thing went along, um, you know, Brian Cardinal became a guy who was started to play in games, um, you know, th- uh, four, five, and six. And so in game six, <laughs> Dirk goes out, we're down five, five minutes in, here comes Cardinal. And we go from down five with seven minutes to go in the first quarter to up seven at the end of the first quarter. And so he was, you know, plus 12 in the first quarter. And then in the second half, I think he took a charge on, you know, one of their star players. It may have been, it may have been Dwayne Wade or something like that. And he was another plus five or six in the second half. So he, he ended up being like plus 15 or 18. 18. In that game. And, it was and 18. It was, it was a major, major, major part of a championship being won. So, and by the way, it is the custodian, you know, that's let's, let's pay respect. We respect his due, please. Look at that. Great detail there. Who plus called, 18 who, in 12 minutes. Who called him the janitor yesterday? Well, I, was well, that no, Carson? Yesterday, Carson Cunningham called him he, the He custodian. called him the custodian. Okay. Yeah, but janitor is frequently where you go. Do you have any dirt on him, Coach, we could maybe throw with? You know, he, he's back in the area, so, you know, playing up at Garen. I, I'm sure you know all of that. But he's going to join us talk a little boilers here in the 9 o'clock hour. No, nah, nah, he's pure perfection, you know. I mean, <laughs> only, the, only, only the game is ugly. The results were always good. And, uh <laughs> He married way above his pay grade too, so you got to get you got to give this guy a lot of credit. Uh, I love That's it. great. Ryan Cardinal going to join us coming up here at nine o'clock. Rick Carlisle live from Chicago again tonight. Eight o'clock. Pacers so far three and one on the road trip. If you don't mind, Coach, I actually want to go back to Friday night and the win over Golden State. Extremely impressive in that game. Miles Turner becomes the franchise's all-time leader in block shots. Uh, you know, Turner has been such a polarizing figure. I feel like. Throughout his time here, um, he's the all-time leader in franchise history in a stat passing Jermaine O'Neal. What I don't know, maybe it's an easy question, but what makes Miles such an elite shot blocker? Well, uh, determination. Um, he has a great attitude for it. He has a tenacity for it. Um, and I, you know, uh, the whole thing about the. Uh, the polarizing, you know, whatever the polarizing aspects are, really, really and truly, the guy, the guy should be um, his body of work that he should be judged on is is the post Sabonis traits because that's really in sort of the the recent modern history of of him being with the Pacers is him playing um, exclusively at the five position and so you know since all that happened. Um, you know he he's had uh, he's had three tremendous years and you know the team's gotten better each year and um, you know two nights ago in and uh, uh, in, in L.A. against the Clippers you know he had another great game so yeah he's uh, he's been a, he's been a special and uh, you know anytime you say all time leading franchise leader or however you want to put it I mean that's that's significant.
Rick Carlisle with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Uh, was the message different going into this road trip? I mean, you, you guys ultra focused. I thought you've had a couple games that were some of your better games as of late. And like I said, second ago, chance to be four and one coach on this road trip would be massive in the standings. What has kind of been the message and the guys staying focused and playing some pretty good basketball here? Well, staying the course, uh, continuing to work at getting better. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that stood out is 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 Siakam has continued to, um, you know, develop his his presence in our in our system, and uh, you know, some some minor adjustments as as we've gone through this um, offensively and then defensively, he's continued to pick up his level, and so, you know, the last three or four games, you know, he's been at a at a uh, at a at a different level there, so more physical, um, more presence you know, on the ball, on the boards. Um, and then offensively, you see what he's done. I mean, he, he's really, he really fits extremely well into what we're doing. Rick Carlisle is with us here. Payless Slickers Hotline again, 8 o'clock, final 8 o'clock game of the season. Of course, we'll see about the playoffs but the, of the regular season tonight in Chicago as they conclude this five-game road trip. We saw Jairus Walker give you some very, very impactful minutes the other night, you turned to him early. Doug McDermott, a little bit of foul trouble. Ben Shepard got the start for Aaron Neesmith, and Walker delivered for you. Uh, what specifically did you like from the rookie the other night? Well, he's he's given us a uh, a window into the future, you know, as to what um, as to what he can be and what he can do for us. And so, um, a lot of this has just been the accumulation of a lot of important. Work that he's done, um, you know, growth, maturity, uh, finding out what it's like to, you know, really have to earn minutes. I mean, here's a talented kid that is has always just been one of the best players. And so, you know, our team, um, pretty pretty good team this year. You know, with with a lot of uh, a lot of good wing players, a lot of good big big wing players. You know, both with uh, with Obi at the beginning of the year, and then you know the the, the trade for Pascal, and so you know, um, really impressive, you know. And, and it wasn't it wasn't just um, one thing; it was it was a lot of things. I mean, he ran, he was physical, he he defended uh, without fouling, um, he drove it, he shot it. Um, and once again, I you know uh, the thing that really is maybe maybe truly most special about um, Jarris is how well he sees the floor in his sense for delivering the ball, you know, pass wise. I mean, there were there were two plays that were really elite. One was uh, an interior pass that was like a bang bang, you know, I got it, no, you got it, and then he he hits he hits Pascal for for a layup in the first half, and then. Late clock, ball swings to him. He had hit. He had already hit a couple threes. Somebody runs out on him. He makes a quick pass to the basket to Jalen Smith, who dunks the ball. You know, as as the Clippers had maybe gotten one or two baskets in a row. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of good things. And you know, now now the the goal and and the, the whole thing is to sustain, be ready. And you know, tonight we got. DeRozan, who's you know been a very difficult player for us and the whole league to deal with, and uh, we'll need him to be ready again. You expect Aaron e. Smith to be out much longer? Uh, I hope not. I hope not. I think there's a chance he plays tonight. I, I, I can't, I can't give you that breaking news for sure. Um, McConnell's got kind of jammed his uh, jammed his ankle a little bit um, right at the end of the minutes he was playing the other. Night, so he'll be he'll be uh, a game time decision, um, but there's a chance that that both of them will play, and you know, if we're unlucky, then 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 maybe 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 just one or maybe neither one of them play. But whatever the case is, you know, we got to have other guys ready. Rick Carlisle with us here uh, on the Payless Liquors Hotline. You know, Coach, you've told us. I, I want to go back and just follow up on, on Jarris for a second. You've you've talked so much this year about you know he's gotten opportunities, he's taken advantage of those opportunities. But also while he's been with the G League team or back and forth between you guys and G League, you know he hasn't he hasn't been pouting about that. Like he has understood, I'm going to develop my game. I'm going to have my he uh, head held high and all those different cliches. Is that something when you guys were a 
evaluating him and drafting him. So many first-round picks play time in the G League now. It's well over 50%. Uh, did, you know he, did you know he had that type of personality that he was going to come in and work no matter if he was with you guys or the G League? Because not all guys would do what he did this season, and that's stay ready. And then you saw the other night how well he played. Well, that's true. And, and, you know, so the answer is yes. The, you know, all the Intel stuff on him and the draft and, and uh, background checks and things like that were that this guy was a, you know, really high character guy and, um, you know, had, you know, multi levels of talent, you know, with, with his ability to um, defend rebound, all that kind of stuff, you know, and really what I see also now is, you know, multiple positions. I mean, you know, he could play, um, you know, he, we, we drafted him really as a, as a four man. And now the way things are looking, he's, he's more of, he, he's really presenting um, more as a three man that can play for, um, which is, you know, a really great thing because it allows us to keep uh, sides in the game, you know? So you know, look, one of the things that, is a fact in this league is that if you can play bigger, your defense and rebounding is just going to be better. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's almost guaranteed. And so, you know, when we made the adjustments around Christmas time and, you know, with our approach to, you know, get our defense better, um, you know, we knew it was, was going to be a significant commitment, but we also knew that one of the things we really needed to do was to play bigger if we could. And so, um, though that has helped us. And I think going forward, what you're seeing is that, uh, you know, Jairus as a, as a guy at six, seven and a half, six, eight, whatever he is, um, you know, if he can be a guy that can play the three and, you know, handle the ball and make plays and shoot it and drive it and defend and rebound and, and be physical, um, you know, then we've got something, you know, even more special than we expected. Rick Carlisle is with us here. Pacers, again, rounding out this five-game road trip in Chicago tonight. It's an 8 o'clock tip. Obviously, our coverage will begin at 7.30. Coach, I want to shift gears a little bit. I remember we had you on uh, probably over a month ago now, and you had you had watched Purdue and Wisconsin uh, a couple days earlier in a hotel room uh, before one of your guys' games. And it, it was interesting. I was listening to something that Stan Van Gundy, who was on the call for Purdue's games this weekend, he mentioned watching Purdue and Matt Painter. He found himself like wanting to jot down some of their sets because he sees like some NBA action in what Purdue runs. I know you're obviously locked into your season, but it, 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 when you do watch Purdue or when you have come across Matt Painter at all, do you see like NBA centric stuff with what Purdue does as they get ready for their Sweet 16 matchup? Yeah, hundred percent. And. uh you know, a lot of a lot of creativity, a lot of movement. Um, you know, they're not just coming down and and you know just punching the ball inside. You know, in the post, and they they do a lot of things where they get they get Edie um, off of movement where he's rolling right down the middle of the lane, and they have action for one of their guards or you know one of their forwards. Um, and you got to love the way the, the, the guards have played this year. I mean, these guys have been uh, rim attackers. They've been mid-range uh, shot makers, and they've been three-point makers. And so, um, you know, all that stuff I, I expect to continue. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know how you zone Purdue with, with Edie in there and, and the way they move the ball and shoot it. So, um, you know, I, everybody's – you know, everybody's looking on with, with great interest. Um, they're, they're obviously very, very well positioned. Um, but when you get to this point of the season, I mean, these games are not going to be easy. You know, they're going to be, they're going to be challenging. Like I, I watched the, the Purdue game the other day. Um, it was, a it was one of our, one of our game days in, in LA, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I picked it up, you know, a little bit into the game, and you know, it it just got away from. I forget who they're playing, but uh, Utah State playing, can, was it Utah State? Yeah, yeah, that that was just, you know, that that would they crushed turned out to be a, 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 a you know an enormous mismatch, and you know, credit to uh, a, a credit to Purdue. So, um, but yeah, but you know, and I've I've watched these guys um, quite a bit during the season. I mean, 
they just happened to be on some at times in hotel rooms and things like that. And, um, and they're fun to watch. And so, you know, obviously wish, wish them the best. And, um, did any of the state win last night in the NIT? They they did. Yeah, they did. 85, 81. Good to see them uh, wearing the uh, the light blue uniforms again. I've heard that they went away from those for a while, but, I mean, how could you possibly do that? Best unis in college basketball, Coach. Yeah. Uh, I, hate to, I hate to ask coaches, Rick Carlisle with us. Uh, we haven't talked to you since uh, you said you were going to settle in on YouTube TV and catch your Virginia Cavaliers oh, in, the, going in the first four. Well, I had to ask. We no. were talking college basketball. How long did you make it through that game, Coach? Uh, I didn't see the whole game. I just picked it up at the at the beginning of the second half. And uh, hey, look, that's a team. I mean, you talk about great coaching. I mean, that that team was third in the ACC, <laughs> you know, during during the regular season. And uh, you know, I I was at one of their games when uh, over All Star break when they they won by two. It was like forty nine forty seven and. Um, you know they 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 have played a style that is just uh, it's it's a u- unique style, but it's been special in terms of of how they've been able to win. You know they got two ACC championships, they got they got a national championship, they got some regular I think mean, they got some regular season championships, and so um, you know it, it was a it was a, an unfortunate ending and uh, felt bad for them, but. Uh, all things considered, you know, getting to the tournament, um, you know, obviously a lot of people were were unsure about that, and I think I talked to you guys about the the thing with Indiana State, and you know, we all we all were were, were very hopeful that they would they would make it, but um, but that was a tough night, and so you know, we'll move on in, into the off season, and you know, all all the stuff that are the new realities of of college basketball with free agency, et cetera. Yep, so we'll. Uh, We'll build we'll we'll build it up or rebuild it from there. Nine games to go for the Pacers. It's been an impressive road trip so far. Three and one. They'll try to stretch that to four and one tonight in Chicago against the Bulls. Coach, good luck, safe travels, and uh, as always, thank you for making a little adjustment with us and joining us this morning. Okay, thanks guys. Take care. Rick Carlisle, Payless Liquors Hotline from Brian Cardinal to Matt Painter, a variety of things there to touch on. I think the Jarris Walker. Stuff is interesting in that, you know, he alluded to you watch Jairus Walker, and I've said this to you, Andy, I'm almost more, I am more impressed by him offensively than defensively, which if you would have stopped me, hell, if you would have stopped me this time last year, I think we watched Houston, he was known as more of the defensive guy, and Jamal Shedd and Marcus Sasser were their big scoring guards. But now I look at him and think, yeah, I mean, offensively, like he gives off like the wing vibes, not the four man vibes, which is totally, what totally Rick what? Carlisle kind of mentioned there. And it's almost it's probably universal across all sports, but like in the NFL, what are what have we seen in the last five to ten years? Safeties are now linebackers and cornerbacks are now safeties. Like the day and age of the big, you know, two hundred and fifty pound thumper at middle linebacker is gone. And I think in the in the NBA, we've seen just a little bit of a, hey, let's get smaller, four around one. Even sometimes, you know, it, it's five guys that can shoot the basketball. So, um, you know, Walker, it, it, it'll be interesting to watch his career involve. But, again, for those that missed it the other night, he was outstanding against the Lakers. And if Aaron e. Smith can't go, uh, chance he plays tonight is what Rick Carlisle said. You would think Jairus Walker would get some consistent run again? Yeah, I think I'm worried coming from that conversation. Uh, I need to see my man TJ McConnell on the floor tonight. Anytime that TJ's not available, that's a huge loss. I mean, you know, they were talking with Chris and Quinn on the call the other night how, you know, he absolutely should be getting consideration for sixth man of the year. I don't know who else would be on that short list. I'm sure there's three, four, five guys that I'm just, you know, not paying attention to but I would agree I would agree with that and then going back to Jarris Walker Jarris Walker has more pep to his step offensively than I thought he was going to have he's kind I, of a I, this is not the best word to use but he's kind of a gunner like he, he's not he, afraid to shoot there, there, there's been a few times where I'm like damn yeah, but, but think <laughs> he's about got a this. neon green light and, and you know for what it's worth he can make him he can yeah, make him he, he can make him I, I think what's funny about Jarris is I almost wonder, and there's a lot of guys that are like this. And, you know, following Kentucky for years, there was a ton of guys that were like this that 
sometimes guys are better here in the league than they are in college. The college game can get very slow it down, bad officiating, coaches that are micromanaging. And spacing's every, a lot yeah, different. Spacing's and also 19 different. year olds become yeah, 21 year olds. Ex- exactly. Their bodies change. They get better coaching. It's you know, it's not school and some of this other stuff. And you can laugh at yes, they go to class and everything else, but this becomes their job in a much more wide open system. I think that's uh partially of what it is. And then, you know, I don't know if if you're if you're Carlisle you know, this would be a question for next year if Jarris blossoms a little bit, and obviously you hope to sign Siakam to the long-term max deal. But, I mean, you can go at times Jarris at the three, um, Siakam at the four, Miles Turner at the five, and then obviously you would throw in Halliburton and however you deal with that second guard position. That's a big lineup. I mean, you're talking about Jarris could play, you know, on the wing as a three, as a guy who's about six eight. Shout out to Mark. McConnell seems like the kid that you'd have to hide his shoes to keep him from playing. I kind of like that, Mark, on TJ McConnell. Again, jammed Mc- ankle. McConnell's good, man. He he is. Game time decision. I don't know if guys are like, he's not going to go by me, but he's going to go by you if you think he's not going you know, to go by that you. that little like, fadeaway pull up and is able to get it off so routinely. I'm, I, I'm quite amazed in watching that. Um, it might not resonate to a lot of people, but. For the first time in, what, probably a month, we didn't feel the need to throw a Tyrese Halliburton-related question at Rick Carlisle. He's shooting now in the month of March 26% from three. Again, I know that number <laughs> looks extremely ugly. Let's not forget, a week ago at this, at this time, Andy, he was 17%. It was, it was 17%, So yeah. the fact that it's risen, our math That's nerds a will know if for a percentage to rise, <laughs> 9% in a week. That's pretty good. Goes to show you That's how much good. better he has shot it here as of late. Obviously, the Bulls have had the Pacers number this season. Uh, I think the biggest thing, you got to just try and stay out of the clutch. I mean, DeRozan late in games um, has been such a thorn in the side of the Pacers throughout his career. And if Aaron Neesmith, of course, is banged up, you know, that's your top defender. Remember back to that Bulls game a few weeks ago. Remember Neesmith committed the sixth foul when you were up three trying to play the foul game. It got to overtime. Neesmith wasn't out there. DeRozan really, really took over there in the OT period. So something to keep an eye on. The Pacers are favored tonight by three and a half. All right, Stephen Holder talking Colts. A lot of owners meeting chatter. Stephen was down there um, in Orlando for that. So he will join us in less than 10 minutes. Before that, got to lead off the morning checkdown with what happened in Terre Haute. The morning checkdown brought to you by the National Invitation Tournament. Experience basketball's beginning with the NIT. Coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse April 2nd and 4th. Yeah, you're right. The last game of the year at the Holman Center was a good one for Indiana State. 85-81 over Cincinnati last night. Big three down the stretch. From your boy Larry Blurred. I've <laughs> changed the hat. Look at the People YouTube. in the YouTube chat yeah, are curious check that about out. it. Check so that usually out. the hat reads Larry Legend. Not um, today. I've gone with the very. I, gosh, my handwriting is horrific. Now that I look at this, it's not that on, bad on the YouTube stream. I've gone with Larry Blurred for oh. Robbie. Don't you want bad handwriting? I mean, I always think bad handwriting. I think athletes and doctors. I think people that got a lot of money have bad handwriting. Well, two things that no one has ever used to describe (laughs) me. Anyway, 85-81, Josh Scherz postgame. Happy with the win. We talked a lot about all the deposits we made all year. You know, come and do in this game. This is going to be, you know, know, a kind of whatever is necessary type game. And that was going to be what was required. Some extraordinary efforts. And I thought we got extraordinary efforts uh, up and down the roster. Could not be prouder of these guys and of course uh you know Robbie as he's done uh you know so many times uh you know with a with a monster you know three to 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 kind of you know give us some separation there late clock a minute to go high pick and roll rec spec goggles just absolute swish there Ryan Conwell I believe on the pick and roll the pike product was key as well Jason Ken at 16 uh Robbie I've Avila with 22, and that broke open. They tied a uh, score at 77 all with a minute to go. 80-77. They stretched it to 85-81, the final. Shout-out to Jizzle James. 
Edrin in the building yeah, last night. How did, how did he do? He had 21. Oh, he was wow. great. I'm looking at it right now. Good for him. He's really emerged late this season for Cincinnati. No so. one says Tara Dice like, uh, like Edrin James. Outstanding with JMV <laughs> yesterday. He, he really was. Edrin James in the building at the Holman Center. Some fond memories in Terre Haute for Edge from his uh, training camp days. I say a little bit of that <laughs> in jest. The only people happier than the folks in Terre Haute about Indiana State going to the Final Four, the people running the NIT, the people that decided to move the NIT from Madison Square Garden to Hinkle Fieldhouse. Coming up Tuesday at Hinkle, Indiana State will be in the Final Four. Uh, we know Georgia will be one of the other opponents. We'll see who will round out that four-man field coming up tonight as the quarterfinal games will continue there for the NIT. So shout out to Indiana State. A hell of a run here throughout the NIT. They'll continue it again Tuesday night at Hinkle. A clear wear, uh, Andy declaring to, for the NBA draft, kind of a foregone conclusion. I think this was the wild expectation. Really, f- for what, since February, since January, when his name started to appear more and more. And, you know, it, it is an, imp- it, an impressive story in the sense of, you know, at Oregon, the dude could barely even play late in the season. And in Indiana, credit to their staff, credit to Cleo Ware for a wake-up call. Uh, he's going to turn himself into, I would say, what, top 25, top 20 picks, something wrong along those lines. Again, I think he's extremely skilled offensively and really protected the rim well. Uh, be curious how that body fills out a little bit more. But Khalil Ware declaring for the draft that gives IU officially seven open scholarships. I said this to lead off the show. I know it's transfer portal season in Bloomington times a million. I think a few of those seven need to go to high school recruits. They, they have to. I think yeah. you've got to you have build to. some substance. Hell, uh, I guess a lazy little bit of limestone foundation, if you will, from whatever, some decommitments that happen late in the spring. We see it every year. IU's got to jump on a few high school kids along with the portal, of course. At some point, we have to talk about this. This is more, you know, June radio. Would you draft Zach Eady or Khalil Ware first? Ooh, that is juicy. <laughs> you like that, that don't you? That sounds like peak the, mid-June radio. <laughs> that is, Corbin, that's June radio right there. Would you take Zach, if you had the 15th pick or the 17th pick, whatever you want, would you take Khalil Ware or you take Zach Eady? They're very different players. Very, They're very, very different, different, different players. players. That is an interesting one. I like where your head's at with that. All right, Colts conversation going to continue on the other side. And as we mentioned with Rick Carlisle, Brian Cardinal, the custodian, Rick Carlisle, made it very clear there. He's going to join us coming up in the 9 o'clock hour. Colts talk next. Hey, JMV, sitting here. This-
All right, Stephen Holger, uh, Holder going to join us here in just a second. Reminder, uh, we'll have that podcast up shortly of Rick Carlisle, 1075thefan.com, a bright, shiny new uh, podcast center on there. I know KB's got a couple different articles. I put one up yesterday. I think, Corbin, you did as well. You put something up about the Colts. So check out all the good stuff you can there at 1075thefan.com. Plus, you can stream us as well. Well, let's keep the Colts conversation going. Stephen Holder joining us from ESPN. And Stephen, uh, a good morning to you. Thank you for backing up a few minutes. You know, going even back to yesterday, Stephen, I've been trying to think, what's the first question I'm going to ask? Because, you know, we got rule changes and, you know, Shane Steichen was so excited about Anthony Richardson a couple days ago. Chris Ballard defending himself a little bit yesterday. What are some of your main one or two takeaways from what the Colts people said or the NFL people said uh, for a couple days there in Orlando? Yeah, I, I would say I, I think we can start sort of at the top with uh, with the NFL. I mean, the, the rules changes. We always have rules changes. I, I've attended this thing for many, many years, and there are always rules changes. But uh, this was pretty dramatic. And this kickoff change is – I don't know how it's going to impact games, but it's, it's absolutely – um, a very dramatic shift. And just from the perspective of watching football, it is going to look entirely and completely different. So I'm, I'm interested to see how it goes. I think I've consistently said this. The, the kickoff procedures of the last year were awful. So I agree with Roger Goodell, and I agree with all the NFL officials there. Uh, you cannot have – a play that was you know, one of the plays that you looked forward to most, you know, historically was in the return game. You can't take that and then make it basically obsolete and expect that not to have a negative impact on the entertainment value. Right. So, so this at least is a step toward rectifying that it doesn't mean it's going to work. And it doesn't mean that, that this is going to necessarily be more palatable, but at least they're trying. Right. So I, I like that. As for the hip drop tackle, I have no idea. Good luck to those yeah, guys. Good but, luck. But but I'll just say this real quick. I don't think you're going to see a ton more flags. Don't ex, don't anticipate that. This is going to be something that gets legislated on film later. So when you see those those infractions come out late in the week during the NFL season, so and so player gets fined eight or nine thousand dollars for this flag or that flag. That's how this is for the most part going to be legislated it's too hard for the officials uh, to make a snap judgment live it's just impossible generally speaking yeah could not agree more on that last part and one thing to add on the new kickoff I was listening to McAfee yesterday he had on the special teams coordinator from the Saints I forget his name I think he's been a big yeah. spearheader and the new kickoff he mentioned some numbers the kickoff rate Return rate last year was 21%. I'm surprised it's that high. It and was that high. Me too. Yeah. 2,000 non-plays is how he referenced it, basically touchbacks. So the thought mm. there is if 21% can grow to whatever, 45 or 50, now you've taken 2,000 plays where it's just pretty much a transactional play, and you turn that into maybe only 1,000 non-plays. You've added 1,000 plays to the game. And so that, I think, is something that wh- when he threw those numbers at me, that made – a lot more sense. Again, Stephen Holder is with us here. His latest Colts GM defends in-house free agent strategy. Let's shift gears to that, Stephen. You did speak with Chris Ballard yesterday. Uh, continuity seems to be the theme here, an open door for maybe Julian Blackman, and we'll see what happens. Cornerback could be the draft for that. Uh, but a little bit of tease on what Chris Ballard had to say in regards to how they've operated here. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that he was – I wouldn't say that his his demeanor was, you know, feisty or anything like that, but he clearly is aware of the sentiment out there, you know, and and I have had some some exchanges with him in the in the recent weeks, you know, since free agency really got started and and it's been clear to me the whole time that he has been aware that that there is a sentiment out there that you're not doing anything, right? And what fair or not, it doesn't matter perception oftentimes with fans is reality you know fan is short for fanatic right that's why we all have jobs you you guys and me amen Uh, so we appreciate them (laughs) so look people are people are really invested in this and you know he is never going to be 
one who cares much about winning the offseason. Now, that is clear. If you haven't figured that out by now, uh, you must be a very new Colts fan, right? But uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't useful uh, ways of using free agency. There's no question about it. And some of his best moves in his eight seasons, or I guess it'll be eight soon, some of his best moves have been free agent signings, frankly, in my estimation. So, so I think it's a fair question, but I also think he makes a very fair point. Like, look, we, if our players had gone out and signed elsewhere, you know, this would have been looked at very differently. Um, and, and cause they would have to go out and replace them, you know, with hundreds of millions of dollars in signings. And that would have looked like a really busy off season. Certainly, certainly. If you if you go out and sign $180 million, the, the guys that the Colts re-signed, uh, that group, that alone was in excess of $180 million in contracts. Had the Colts done that with outside players, I mean, they'd be throwing them a parade right now, right? So but it doesn't, what does that even mean, though, in the grand scheme, if their, if their talent is gone, right? So I think that is the question. Right now, what they're looking at is, a couple things they're banking on, I think. Number one, the thing is the continuity is not just you're going to be the same. That's the one distinction they would make, Shane Steichen and Chris Ballard. Whether they're right, that will be determined. But, you know, let's give them the floor, right? Let's give them a chance to respond. So their, their opinion on this is that, look, continuity leads to progress. And I think there is some, there's some track record of that being true in the NFL, right? And then the other thing is, we're not going to be the same team next year. Anthony Richardson is a huge addition. I will say this, fair or not, right or wrong, better or worse, there is an unfreaking believable belief in Anthony Richardson at the top of this organization right now. They are all in. They think this kid is fantastic. And they think, frankly, they would have made the playoffs perhaps easily last year with Anthony Richardson. If that thought is there, Stephen, then is there a thought internally of this is your opportunity to maximize that, and you see teams around the league with rookie contract quarterbacks try to take advantage of that even further? Has that been something that was discussed at all? Well, sure, yes, for sure. That Chris Ballard acknowledges that. But what he said is, look, he said, we have, we have resources – and I think this is his way of saying, like, look, we, we were going to spend what we were going to spend on whoever, right? On our guys, other guys, whatever. But the money they were going to spend, I don't know the numbers, and I don't know what those, what those limitations are. But whatever they planned on spending, they, they had that number in mind or that, you know, generally speaking, that ballpark number in mind. And they were going to move forward within those parameters. It just so happened that spending – happened mostly in, internally. So I think that was his way of saying, like, look, I mean, this is not a free-for-all, <laughs> you know, and, and whether that's just a line or an excuse, I don't know. You know, maybe that's in the eye of the beholder. But, uh, but, but I do think there are limitations. I do think there are financial realities. I'm not calling the Colts poor. Uh, Jamerce has two private jets, right? I mean, they're not poor. I mean, come on. But – uh, we're talking about an era where payrolls are, you know, in excess of $200 million per year. You know, we're talking about a lot of money. And, and once you start getting into the upper reaches of that, every dollar you add, you know, it's, it, it, it throws things off a little bit more, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing to go from 150 to 165 million or something, but, you know, once you start getting into an area where you're uncomfortable, they will show restraint in terms of the Colts, at least, you know, they will show restraint. They have proven that. So I think that's where they're at right now. Um, it wasn't, they didn't design it that way. It's just so happened that, you know, the guys that they targeted, they couldn't reach deals with those guys or didn't want to pay what they what, talking about outsiders here. Didn't want to pay what they were asking. So they turned their attention inward and, and went ahead and re-signed their guys. 
Stephen Holder with us. Yeah, Stephen, and here's the thing. If they close the game against, you know, Cleveland or Houston at the end of the year and they make the playoffs, everyone wants all these guys back. And so right, it's, a very right. fi- it's a very fickle thing in the NFL. Uh, Stephen Holder with us from ESPN following the Colts. Julian Blackman uh, he visited the Bills, the 49ers as well. Avenues of communication still open there between his reps and Chris Ballard and the Colts. What's your lay of the land? What's going on with Julian, do you think? Yeah, so they have re-engaged, I guess I would say, the Colts and Julian Blackman uh, really mostly this week that that has started again, those conversations. So so that's on the table. I don't know if I would call it close, not close. I, I wouldn't characterize it because I don't know. But but the fact that they are in talks again, I think is a is a positive um a positive development. And then the other thing I would say is is very clear to me. Uh, that they understand they have to make a move at safety. I I anticipate that will happen. Um, I'm pretty confident in saying that's going to happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen today, next week, or two weeks from now. It may not because you still have uh, a a safety market where there are multiple veterans available. So they're fine being patient about it. And frankly, that's part of the reason uh, that, that this has been hard for Julian Blackman. You know, the, the market is a little bit cluttered. Uh, he's, he's not in a position of strength. Uh, so he's, he's got to just deal with that reality, and, and then we'll see how it ends up. But, but they like him. He's, he's going to be – he's obviously a coveted player. He's taking those visits, so we'll see where that goes. But, but I expect a safety signing. And then the other, my other takeaway is that Chris Ballard didn't say this, but I'm very good at reading between lines. Um, <laughs> that first-round pick. Uh, cornerback is at top of my list, frankly. Okay. Stephen Holder with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Stephen, you're reporting in the in your latest on ESPN.com. You mentioned in there that the Colts did offer more than the Texans for Daniil Hunter. Um, Daniil Hunter, if I'm not mistaken, Hunter's got ties to Houston, right? Like hometown. That's or, correct. Yeah. That is correct. Um, and so the Colts knew that that was going to be a complicating factor in that negotiation, the, the, the hometown factor, and it proved to be true. So, but yes, now just to clarify real quick, when you say you offered more, that can take different forms, right? What is the structure? What were the bonuses? What was guaranteed? That's the part that's a little bit uh, murky, but overall, my understanding is there was more overall money uh, in terms of the maximum amount of money he could have made. Is that an indicator of what they think, of their edge need and that like edge rusher maybe is more of a need than we thought. I I think edge rusher should be a huge need, frankly, but you know, obviously we haven't seen anything else in free agency play out. Or do you view that as a little bit more of a, no, this is just a unique situation with Hunter being a very accomplished pass rusher. And if not him, they're not going to force it with whatever a B or C level player. Well, it's a great question. It's the right question. I actually think the answer is a little complicated. It's not as straightforward, I guess. I think the answer is a little bit of both. What I would say is, yes, it does say that that they, I think what we already know, which is they don't have a truly elite edge rusher. They haven't had one for a very long time. That's, it is what it is. And that's a reality. I think it's their way of acknowledging that. But also, I think it, it is uh, a reflection of, of the player that he is. They don't typically go out there and, and chase people. It's just not what they do. Not not guys who are at the very top of their of their market. You know that's just not the Colts' way. Uh, but you also don't get guys like that making it to free agency quite that often. So I would say that is actually consistent with what Chris Ballard tends to say. You know he doesn't want to pay, like he always says, I don't want to pay a money to B players. Blah blah blah. Right? We hear that all the time. Well, this guy actually is probably an A player, and he got a plus money (laughs) so uh but i guess that's a that's a concession you're willing to make i'd play a plus money for an a player that's a i can sleep at night doing that and i think that's what that says to me um he he was definitely a unique situation the the vikings are in a unique situation justin jefferson you know kirk cousins walking away they got to figure out their quarterback so they they were not going to retain him generally a guy like that doesn't make it to the market so i think that's what that indicates to me 
Okay, then last one. Appreciate your time. I know it's a crazy week for you and traveling back yeah. from Florida. Um, oh, just... listen, no, I'm not traveling anywhere. Okay, my wife and my daughter came down because it's spring break. Good for and, you. <laughs> and well, hey, but hey, yours truly is a Disney employee now, right? So you know what that means: uh, free park access. Which Look is, at this. Uh, which is great, I guess. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> now, uh, good for you. Walk us through this. Is this multiple days at Disney? Tell me it's not. Um, look, I was working yesterday. They were at Animal Kingdom. Okay. Uh, complaining, oh, it's really hot and the lines are long. And I was like, well, how much did you pay to get in there? There you go. Nothing. Yeah. Right, uh, perks, the case. perks from that. Yeah, I think- it was 47 degrees and windy here yesterday, Stephen. So tell them that as well. <laughs> I'm sitting outside by the pool doing this interview, oh. guys. I'm sorry, but it's only like 70. The water's probably cold. Life is hard right now for Stephen Holder <laughs> down there in his home state of Florida. We'll end with this. Just putting a yeah. bow tie on Legereus Sneed because that became yeah. official over the weekend. Um, you made it clear this was not necessarily about the draft pick compensation. I believe a third rounder and flipping of seventh round picks is what Tennessee sent Kansas City. But it was always about the contract for the Colts mm-hmm. in assessing a player they would qualify as good, not great? Yeah, I I stay. I would say that I stand by that even more so after the meetings, just, just getting a little more insight on that because I, I did have conversations about that in Orlando. I would say that is more true. That, I feel like that's even more true now. Um, well, I, I feel more confident, I guess, in saying that and more emboldened in saying that. Um, look, he's a good player, a really good player. Uh, there's no question about it. I would say this, Chris Ballard has a lot of history in Kansas City, correct? Uh, he worked there for quite a while. He he knows people up and down that organization. So he had a lot of insight about that situation and about uh, whether that was a player they wanted to, to invest in at that level. Uh, so so that, I think that informed his decision. I don't know all the details of how they – how they came to the decision of, you know, do we want this player or not? You know, from a football perspective, you know, I can't speak to that. But but I would say they were very well informed in terms of making their decision. Let's leave it at that. Stephen Holder getting the last laugh at the pool here on this Wednesday morning as we sit in a studio with no windows. That's <laughs> that where we are at here. Awful. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That... Right, I'm on my way to. Uh, well, I got. I guess I got to get some work done before I go. But when I do, once I do, uh, I guess we're going to Hollywood Studios today. So we'll check that out. Look Looking at up. that. The Holder family. I like in it. Yeah, man. Florida yeah. here. Yeah, good time. Uh, celebrating. Listen, I got to get something out of the mouse deal. Okay, man. I mean, celebrating like, I mean, the Disney know. perks. Yeah, man. I mean, do you know how much money Disney I... makes? Okay, <laughs> I, I contribute at least three dollars to that. Right. So I'm getting my. Getting something out of it. Bowen family still go. a few years away. The one story of I have an older brother, five and a half years older. He, you know, we have a cousin that is the same age as well. So we all go to Disney when I was a young, young lad. We get off the <laughs> flight. We see characters in the airport. Kevin Bowen is crying and crying and Ugh. crying. So the Ugh, code I word, I forget what the code word was, but they would all shout out what the code word was when a character would appear the rest of the week. And my dad would quickly pick me up and try to shield me from said characters so softness abound for yours truly at the sight of characters back in the day that is so sad it is so, is sad. so it really sad is. yeah a lot of wow. i think mickey mouse pancakes i ate in the hotel and not a lot of site visits to the park <laughs> steven enjoy safe travels home whenever that does happen all right guys see you soon steven holder pay less liquors hotline live from the pool down there in florida forcing the quarterback cornerback knee corner 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 at 15 overall, Andy Sweeney, I just don't love the sound of it, especially in a year when you just you drafted three corners last year. I mean, Ballard said how much he loved the corners, you know, and you'd imagine he loved the corners that they took last year. And then on top of it, you got to think, you know, they have Kenny Moore and then they bring somebody in in free agency. You would yeah, you I would did. think as well might not be a big it's not going to be a big time player or name. But Go back to raising come the on. floor at corner like you've got some ceiling potential with the young corners, you would think. But again, a little bit of a veteran guy in there, I think, would help you stability wise, try and raise the floor at a position that certainly you had issues at last I, I know season. I know we're up against it, but Corbin, at some point, 
KB here is going to be lined up at 6.30 in the morning with 5,000 other people to run that in. sounds with, like hell. To, to sprint into the park so they can get on the Toy Story ride, you know, within 45 minutes. It's in his future. He, it's just, he doesn't know if it's a year, if it's two years, if it's six months. It's going to happen. I might fake COVID that week if that's still a thing <laughs> a few years down the road. Oh, Purdue oh, talk. <laughs> Brian Cardinal. The custodian Rick Carlisle wants us to make sure we throw that at him. Brian Cardinal joins us here in about 20. Getting quality employees to support.
All right, so Brian Cardinal going to join us here coming up at 9.15. Uh, cannot wait for that. You know, we have a couple minutes uh, here, and it's funny, KB, and, you know, we're looking at each other. It's like, you know, we, we can talk about three or four different things. I'm going to bring up something you did not think was going to be on the bingo card today, but it is on the show sheet, okay? Uh, and we're not going to get into specifics of what is going on because I don't totally know. But did you see yesterday? <laughs> It's an unbelievable story. So, Diddy, P. Diddy, his home has been raided a couple days ago, right? By the – have you you paid attention yeah. to this story at all? The headline I saw was there was an involvement of a former Syracuse uh, basketball uh, player. Okay, so one of the guys, I guess, at his home was former Syracuse player – Brendan Paul. I don't remember him at all. Who was, he was a walk-on guard from 2018 to 2020. He's now 25 years old. Now, when they put his photo up, I mean, this is a photo of him, KB. You don't remember. He didn't play very much, okay? Yeah, there's nobody in the crowd. <laughs> there, there, maybe that was the COVID year. I'm, I'm not kidding. It looks like it probably was. Or Syracuse has been down on their luck lately. Uh, and so, immediately, people started to say, wait a minute. Like, people knew who it was. I didn't know who it was. Brendan Paul was booked yesterday for cocaine and controlled substance possession. He was released $2,500 bail. But so that worked its way. That was in Miami. It's just an odd connection that P. Diddy's one of his, I mean, I guess alleged, I mean, he's been called like a mule for P. Diddy, was Brendan Paul, who was a walk on guard for Syracuse in 2018. Isn't that like I'm laughing? It's not funny, but it's just an odd story yeah, there's that a, somehow hit college basketball in the ACC yesterday. There's a Jim Beheim zone defense joke somewhere in Boy, there. Probably. I, ju- I just don't know probably. where it's at. Brian Cardinal in 15. <laughs> how much uh, did Purdue check the boxes that Matt Painter laid out for them for a Final Four run this weekend? We'll explain on the other side. The offseason.
fan. We had Dion, uh, our fearless leader in here, and he was mentioning Indiana State. You heard the promo there by JMV. We played some of the shirts sound today. You know, it's funny. Your iPad basically listens, just like your iPhone, KB, it listens to you. You know that, right? And then it puts up ads and tweets and everything else that uh, that are you know basically of what you're talking about. I saw this because I do not follow this young man. His name is Jared Burson, okay? Indiana State, 31-6 and six on the season, right? They're headed to the NIT Final Four. No team has won 32 games in a season in which it did not play in the NCAA tournament since the tournament field grew to 16 teams all the way back in 1951. So literally next, what is it, Tuesday? Salt meat uh, Literally, Indiana State, they'll be playing for the record for the most wins ever by a non-NCAA tournament team. How about that for a stat on a Wednesday morning? Some salt in the wounds oh. there. Quite the scene last night in Terre Haute again. Tuesday at Hinkle, Indiana State, going to be in the final four of the NIT. We'll have Brian Cardinal join us in about 10 minutes. You know, before the tournament started, Andy, Matt Painter laid out three keys for his team to get to the final four. And, you know, when you look at them, they can be kind of like elementary keys. I mean, I'm sure they're similar keys to, you know, whatever uh, Clay Junior High has to win the Hamilton County Championship. (laughs) But the three keys were this, taking care of the basketball, make your free throws, and then the be grimy on defense key, which I'm sure Brian Cardinal probably loves hearing that description. Which, by the way, this team is this season. Right, Purdue. I, I would for the say most part, yeah, I, I like would they say, don't mind getting on the floor and getting a little yeah, yeah, bit yeah, dirty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, I, I guess how do you define right. grimy on defense? Yes, is it just getting on the floor? Is it literally how many points you give up? Like, I that one of course has a little bit more gray area to it than the black and white nature. But yeah, Purdue typically is a team that certainly hustles and hustles and hustles. Uh, you look at those three, you know, boxes to check. Taking care of the basketball. That is. The reason why Matt Painter said that first was for a reason. I mean, that's been, we've talked about the stat, 13 turnovers or more in a game. Uh, That's when it gets a little murky. 12 and under, they're undefeated. Uh, They just had games of five and eight total turnovers. So obviously, great job in taking care of the basketball on the opening round weekend. Free throw percentage was a little Jekyll and Hyde. They shot a terrible from the foul line they, against Grambling. They shot a 59%. Yeah, I was yeah. looking it up. Just 59.1 from the line. That is bad. Much better against Utah State. That was 82%. So a little bit of a mixed bag there when you look at free throw percentage, which they've kind of been an average free throw percentage team this season. They, they get to the foul line, of course, a ton. Uh, but a little bit average in just making those free throws. And then grimy on defense, you know, they allowed 58 and 67. Um, you know, that's you know, those are some of their lower totals of the season. Obviously, the competition, not immense there. But all in all, if you look at those three, I mean, it goes without saying, and I'm probably just stating the obvious here, but if they could keep up single-digit turnovers in Detroit, just book the— book Yeah, they're going to be in they're gonna be in Phoenix. And book the flight yeah, right no now doubt. And, and get used to Google in the stadium being like, wait, it's in Glendale? That's nowhere near close to, you know, whatever, Phoenix proper? So— um, so far, you look at those keys, and the most important one, outstanding opening round weekend for Purdue and doing that. Let, let me ask you this, just as a general conversation piece, not like I'm quizzing you. What would you like to see them do? Like, what's something that maybe this weekend? Because, you know, I thought Grambling was... I mean, I don't know. It's a 16 seed. They got the bugaboo, you know, uh, off their back. They got the monkey off their back. All that, all that other nonsense has been said. But I, I was just like kind of okay with that performance. I thought it was like a, like a B minus. You mentioned they shot 50. What it was a 59 or 50? Yeah, 59 percent from the line. Like I thought they were fine. I didn't think they were against Grambling as sharp as I thought they were going to be. I thought they were going to be Grambling the way they beat Utah State. Does that make sense? And I thought maybe they struggled a little bit longer with Utah State the way they did Grambling, and then they won that game uh, kind of in the same manner. But that's like they almost flip flopped games. I thought they'd get way ahead of Grambling to where the twenty-seven and a half point spread was fine. Again, we needed a a savior. Who was it? is it? Carson Barrett? Is that who we got to uh, my my savior? Sam, at the, sounds at, right. At the Sam end, King, at, Chase yeah, Martin. At, I don't know. One of those Purdue walk ons at the end of the game. So. I don't know. I'm I'm searching because like you could look at the stats and say, well, well, Lance Jones needs to shoot. You know, he needs to score more. But you know, I I think the 
positive that Matt Painter has said is, listen, we we don't need him to run and gun and to take bad shots. We need him to be in our offense and to play really good defense and then pick his spots. And I think he's done that. So in Matt Painter, in my eyes, I say, well, why don't you go score some more points, Lance? In Matt Painter's eyes, I think he is doing the job and the duty that that he wants him to do. Now, I will say, you know, to win six games and to win the uh, the college, you know, the NCAA championship. There's going to be a game where they may need some Lance Jones Yolo. They might need him to take three or four shots that not too many of the other guys uh, on the team are going to be able to take and make. And you know that may happen in Detroit. It, you know, if they get by that, it may happen whoever they play in Phoenix if it gets that far. But you know, the way they played, the way they dominated Utah State, it's like. We haven't talked about anything that might scare you for this weekend because they took the soul of a team in the round of 32 in a way that you just normally don't see in an NCAA tournament setting against a reputable opponent. Yeah, I mean, as far as Gonzaga on Friday night, like I think Graham E.K., their big guy who's been a very consistent score for him, I think he'll get pretty neutralized by just Zach Eady's size. Um, I think Lance Jones and Matt Painter talked about this. I think his defense on a guy like Ryan Nemhard is going to be huge. That is the brother of Andrew Nemhard. He is, you know, in a way, I mean, he is their Braden Smith. I mean, he is their quarterback of it all and has had some games a very similar fashion this season. I also think this is the regional as a whole. I I just, I was not one on Selection Sunday, and I'm certainly not one now that looks at this Midwest region and thinks Purdue got this, like, great unbelievable opponent draw. Yeah, well, definitely not now. I mean, we're talking four of the top 12 teams in Ken Palm, if you want to look at it like that. And, you know, the thing about Gonzaga, Creighton, and Tennessee, there's no fluke here. I mean, Gonzaga, nine straight Sweet 16s. You think they know how to win in the tournament? Uh, I know they've turned over a decent amount of their roster, but they were in the Elite Eight last year. Creighton was a shot away from the Final Four. Last season, and brought back a lot, and brought back just about everybody. Yeah, Tennessee brought back a lot. Yes, they had a huge acquisition in Dalton Connect, but still, they bring back a big time core. And I do think I know it was four and a half months ago, but I do think the fact that Tennessee and Gonzaga have seen Edie before that helps them out. Like it won't be just this unbelievable shock that sometimes Purdue can just hit you in the face in the first ten minutes. And boom, you've got seven fouls. Your two big guys are on the bench, and you're looking at the sideline like, what the hell do we do? And by that point, Purdue's in the bonus, Yep. and you're in foul trouble. And you're doubly needy, and he's kicking it out, and Fletcher Lawyer's wide open. And you're swimming upstream for the next 30 minutes from there. Now, again, I think Purdue's going to advance. I've got Purdue winning all. I've got Purdue beating Arizona in the title game. But I just think that this is a – I don't know. Maybe I read too much in a selection Sunday night and, you know, that Monday after – it just seemed like everyone was like, man, Purdue's got a cakewalk. Look at this region. They've already beaten Gonzaga. They've already beat Tennessee. Well, yeah, but I mean, let's go back to that Gonzaga game. Gonzaga was up five and a half. They had their worst three-point shooting game of the season. They've shot it a lot better in the last month. Like, teams can evolve. Again, I still think Purdue can well get through this region, but I don't think all of a sudden they get to the Sweet 16 Elite Eight and they're like, oh, they got the monkey off their back. They're going to breeze through this. Um, I don't envision that. I think this is a very, very difficult, you know, Sweet 16 and Elite Eight for them. And there's there's established great coaches in this region uh, and, and teams that I just don't look at and think, you know, uh, NC State's a fluke. Clemson's a fluke. There ain't that in these three teams here opposite Purdue. Yeah, there, there's not. I, I would even – I would say this. You're partially – Talking about me, <laughs> partially, and the only, yeah, I, but I think I guess, everybody really I think a, thought that. I, I just I, because here's why: Kansas was left for dead. We were right about Kansas. I say we, the people that thought, okay, Purdue's got a nice little road here. We were, you know, Kansas was left for dead. But where I was wrong was Gonzaga. I, I don't mind admitting it. W- was Gonzaga? I mean, I you know, I didn't know Gonzaga was gonna move was gonna move through. And even so, I have probably downplayed the Zags a little bit more maybe than I should have. I gave you my Gonzaga spiel yesterday. I don't need to do that. And then on the bottom end of the bracket, you know, this has been where you can't face Crane and Tennessee both, right? So that needs to be said. This is where Tennessee with Rick Barnes, has literally bowed out every time. 
they don't get past this game coming up on Friday night against Creighton. So it's opened up, you know, if you don't believe in the Zags, if you thought, I mean, remember, they played McNeese State. Remember, that was the that was the sexiest pick. Right, of double-digit right, yeah. seeds I mean, I was, through, yeah, yeah. was McNeese State. So, you know, on Selection Sunday, we looked at it. We said, okay, they'll get through the first weekend. And then we all sat here and said, well, you know, they'll get McNeese State. And then you look at the bottom, and you're thinking, okay, so basically they'll have to beat McNeese and Creighton to get in to the Final Four. And I think people just rounded that off and said, wow, that's exactly what it's going to be. It hasn't worked out that way, right? Gonzaga has proven to be, uh, you know, playing much better basketball at the end of the year. So, I mean, that's the reason. I have fun with it. That's the reason that so much analysis going into this, going into any NCAA tournament, you just got to take it with a grain of salt. Bleep happens, man, when those games start. They just do. Top left, bottom right. UConn top left, Purdue bottom right. Those are the two regions that have stayed as truest to form. Obviously, Auburn and Kansas both lost, but still, you don't, again, Clemson is pretty, I mean, that... A lot of people, they had Clemson losing in New Mexico sure. oh, yeah. in round I, one. I, I did. Yeah. I, I had Clemson losing. I'm as stunned that Clemson's in the Sweet 16 as anybody. And they, I, like, they like semi-handled Baylor, you know, for large stretch. I mean, that was a double-digit lead for large stretches of that game. All right, Brian Cardinal going to join us in a few. Let's do a quick morning check down before we get to Brian Cardinal. The Morning Checkdown, brought to you by the Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament. Elevate the game at the inaugural WBIT, coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse, April 1st and 3rd. Yeah, I wanted to get I, I wanted to get this sound out there. We'll get to Indiana State. Obviously, the Pacers back in action tonight. Jim Mercer's daughter, Kaylin, was on with Pat McAfee yesterday. We played this all the way back at 730. Let's play it again here. Again, this is per ESPN and the Pat McAfee show. Uh, she was asked by McAfee. How's Jim doing? How's Mr. Ursay doing? Here's that conversation. Good. He's 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 doing better. He's not here, obviously, because he's still recovering. Um, but everyone's been just so kind and gracious and, and checking on him, asking about him. And I heard it was not good, right? Is that accurate? Your dad's a tough dude. Though, he obviously. is a tough dude. Um, and I think, you know, of course, I'm not going, going to specifics about his medical condition. He can answer those questions for himself. But, um, you know, it's going to be a long road for him. But he's... Um, getting better every day. So that was Kaylin Jackson, the youngest Ursay daughter, down there at the owners' meetings with Pat McAfee yesterday. We had Stephen Holder on earlier. Talked a lot more about the specifics of the Colts offseason. Chris Ballard related. You can check that out on the podcast. Um, quick basketball rundown before we give Brian Cardinal a call. Indiana State moving on to the Final Four of the NIT, eighty-five, eighty-one over Cincinnati. Robbie. Avila with a big three at the top of the key with a minute to go to give Indiana State a three-point lead. Again, they will play Tuesday night at Hinkle Fieldhouse in the Final Four. Pacers are a a three-and-a-half-point favorite tonight over the Bulls. Chicago has had their number this season. We'll see about TJ McConnell and Aaron Neesmith. Rick Carlisle labeled both as game-time decisions uh, when he joined us earlier in the show. Again, this wraps up a five-game road trip for the Pacers uh, so far, three and one on the road trip. You want to go ahead and call him, or is he calling us? Yes, give Brian Cardinal. Go a ahead, call Corbin. Here. We'll vamp until until Brian Cardinal, the janitor, custodian, citizen Kane, is ready to go with us. A couple just other items to add to that. Uh, Legarius Sneed got his contract with the Tennessee Titans. Of course, traded there last week. Four years, seventy six point four mil. Now fifty five of that is guaranteed. And then another corner off the board for the Colts, Tredavious White. If you remember, many good years there in Buffalo. He got a one year. deal. Deal, 8.5 mil that could get all the way up to 10 mil KB it's worth mentioning he missed 28 games the last three seasons yeah and still curious about corner and safety there are some names out there for the Colts again the list starting to dry up a little bit you know I, I would safety you have to make some sort of move whether it's bringing back Julian Blackman or something else corner you know do you go there or is this you know all in on the draft and then you know what, I brought up Stephen Holder earlier, Andy. I mean, they made a run at Daniil Hunter. Does that mean they view the edge rusher need right. a little bit more than maybe we thought? I, I would That's love that. That's a great that. point. But 
Uh, we'll see how that unfolds here the rest of the offseason. All right, let's keep the Purdue conversation. Let's have some fun here. Brian Cardinal, Purdue great, joining us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Brian, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Before we dive into Purdue or, or maybe your playing career or anything else, we had your old head coach on in the 8 o'clock hour, Rick Carlisle, and he was uh, giving you props about your play in the 2011 NBA Finals. He said he had no dirt on he, him. He even remembered your plus minus in game six. Do you remember your plus minus in game six of the finals in 2011? Oh, goodness. I, I don't. I don't. I'm just grateful that uh, coach put me in the game. That's it. That's all I know. He, he remembered a third. Dirk, Dirk got two yeah, fouls. Yeah, and you, you came in the game. You were plus 18. And, like, he remembered you were plus 12 in the first half and plus six in the second half. And he said you drew a charge against, he thought, Dwayne Wade in the third quarter. Do you remember the play in the third quarter by any chance? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember the uh, I remember the charge. And uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't overly happy with me. And uh, uh, Dwayne, that is. And... Uh, yeah, I, I tell you that that whole that whole experience, that whole opportunity to play, you know, coach having faith in me to put me in the game, and and you know, I I hadn't played a lot, you know, throughout the playoffs, and and he saw something, and he had the trust and faith in me to to put me in, insert me, and and uh, you know, it's that's the beauty of sports, right? That's the beauty of of staying ready. And, and not knowing when your number is going to get called, not knowing when you're going to get put in the game and, and just being ready and, and, and playing at a high level. And I'm just grateful again for the opportunity and the trust that he had in me to put me in that game. Now, Brian, that game that was series. The, the, that game was in Miami, correct? Clinching game for you guys. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I was in Miami and uh, you know, I, I remember we, we won game five and we went back in the locker room and, 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 you know, back back then, you know, Jason Terry, the legend, you know, every, you know, for the most part, on our closeout games, you know, when when uh, you know whether it was Portland or OKC or the Lakers, you know, we would always try to wear black for that closeout game because we were because he he you know Jet, Jet said we were going to somebody's <laughs> funeral, and and Love that. you know, and and so we wore black, and again after that after that game five. We just went in the locker room and we were focused and, you know, we said we're, go we're wearing black, we're wearing one outfit, packing for one one night, and let's go get it. And uh, and it was awesome. Yeah, I I've been to a bachelor party in Miami. I think it's knocked probably three to four years off my life whenever <laughs> that does happen. I can only imagine celebrating a championship <laughs> on South oh. Beach. Yeah, oh, that had oh, to be quite oh, the that, scene. That, that, night was, that night was legendary, and then we get back to <laughs> Dallas and – and uh, and Dallas was just was was a special place is a special place and and they were hungry for a championship an NBA championship and and we partied like rock stars for that next week and uh, and I still remember uh, Dirk threw out the the first pitch for the Rangers game maybe you know maybe a week after we won it or five days after we won it or something and and they had made a jersey for me because because I was going to go out there and 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 we you know several of us were going to go and, and, uh, and I, I just, I couldn't drink anymore. My body was just rejecting, <laughs> just being alive. And I just, I told, I told my buddies, I told those guys, I said, I'm flying home this morning. I gotta, I gotta go back to Indiana. And, uh, uh, he threw out that first pitch and, and they, they continued to celebrate, but, uh, that was, it was a spectacular time, a spectacular moment in uh, my basketball career. And, in life in general. And you're the guy that thinks about leaving the bachelor party Saturday night. Can I, can I find a <laughs> flight to get home here before no Sunday? No My body was just rejecting everything. <laughs> and so I just, I just needed to, 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 to bolt. I needed to get out of there. He is the one and only Brian Cardinal, of course, Purdue legend joining us here on the pay less liquors hotline, Purdue guests all week long, all tournament long. And we appreciate Brian's time here on this Wednesday morning. Let's talk present day first. Your thoughts on the opening round weekend and what you've seen from this Boiler team really all season long as they head into the Sweet 16. Yeah, no, it's, you know, Coach Painter's got them playing at a high level. You know, those guys are hungry. Those guys are, they're excited for the opportunity for the moment. Um, you know, and, and they, they played, they played great all year. And, uh, you know, they played great, you know, the opening round. 
Um, but the beauty of it is, is you got to keep, keep it going. Somebody's going to have to play special and, and, uh, you know, regardless of, uh, of the opponent, you know, we had, we had guys step up in that first game, that second game. And, uh, you know, it's going to have to continue to happen against Gonzaga. And, 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 and as we continue to go through the tourney. Brian Cardinal with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. You know, I was going to ask you if if you had to be, and you can answer this, if you had to be thrown in the game uh, and you had to guard Zach Eady, who is 7'5", how would you do it? But I also got thinking, you know, you're more of obviously of a power forward at about 6'8". How do you think you would play, you know, tr- um, um, Kaufman Wren has had to do this all year. How would you play next? How would you compliment, if you were playing today, how would you compliment Zach Eady, who is so dominant? Oh, man. So so, so you're not asking how I'm guarding no. him. You're asking how I would compliment I, I, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. How, 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 would, how would you play uh, yeah, next to him? You know, he's 7'5", and he's so dominant, and everyone's paying attention to him. You know, Kaufman Wren had a great weekend himself. Yeah, no, you know, well, you know, this is a lot easier question to answer than uh, than asking me how to guard him. <laughs> sure. Um, he, you know, you know, you know, Paint has has assembled a spectacular team around Zach, and and you know, Trey's awesome in his own own right. You know, Braden and 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 so on. Um, you know, the four that are on the court with Zach, Zach draw draws so much attention, rightfully so. Those other guys have to be ready to knock down shots. Those other guys have to be ready to, to, you know, to step up when when they have their moment. And for me specifically, I, you know, I think, you know, I think I would just be a spot up shooter, a spot up four, um, you know, ready to knock down the shot. Um, you know, and at the same time, you've got to be ready because if Zach does does miss. They're not coming off very long, and so you got to find your way. You got to battle your way in there to get some of those offensive rebounds and tip outs. And and when the ball comes out, you got to be ready to knock it down. He is Brian Cardinal. He's with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Brian, we had Carson Cunningham on yesterday, and he shared some great stories about your guys' years and and specifically that 2000 run to the Elite Eight. It was the unusual, you know, six versus eight seed. You don't see that very often in the trip to go to the final four. When you think back on that year, on that run, what are some of the memories that pop into your mind? Oh, well, you know, that was, that was, that was a great time. You know, you know, we had, we had a great team um, and we were a team. We didn't have anybody that was overly dominant, but we just played our tail off. um, And we had guys that, that could, that could play their role to a T and, you know, the, the biggest thing that stands out in my mind is, is just, you know, the team's overall focus and, and, and desire to get Coach Katie to that Final Four. And, uh, and that's, and that's, that's what, what sticks in my mind. You know, the games are great. The wins are great. Uh, you know, the emotions are incredible. But my focus, and, and it's the one thing that I look back at my basketball career throughout my life and it's the one thing that stands out and it's a crushing, crushing thought because I, I just wanted so bad to get coach Katie to that final four and, and to help, you know, elevate his stature to validate his career, right. You know, right or wrong, everybody, you know, if you get to a final four, it, it, it gets you to another tier in people's eyes. It gets you, it validates your coaching career and coach Katie didn't need it. Didn't want it. You know, you know, he's a great coach in itself, but I, I wanted to get him there because I wanted people to know how amazing coach Katie was in my life, how amazing he's been to so many past players and, 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 and even current players, you know, just hit, you know, coach Katie is a special human being and, and uh, I would have loved to have got him to that final four and been on that team. I know you're not, you know, in it uh, certainly like you were as a player, but from afar, w- what similarities do you see in Matt Painter teams to what Gene Cady certainly instilled for years in West Lafayette? Well, I think you know, Coach Coach Painter's teams, you know, they're they're passionate, they're um, you know, they're tough, they're gritty, you know, they just they just have an attitude and a will to win, and and that's and that that's you know, mentally tough. That that's that's a that plays a significant role when you're out there on that court. You have a confidence and, and, you know, 
you know, very similar to Coach Katie, you know, Coach Painter, you know, he's confident in his players. He trusts his players, and his players are willing to do whatever they can for Coach Painter and, and for for their fellow teammates. And uh, and I think that says a lot. I think that says a lot about Coach Painter and the staff. You know, when you have people that believe in you, you know, to your core, that's that's pretty that's pretty substantial. That's pretty that's pretty impressive. Brian Cardinal with us, uh, hanging out with us a couple more minutes here on the Pay Less Liquors Hotline. We're getting you ready, of course, for this weekend. Uh, cannot wait to see what's going to be going down in Detroit. Uh, it might be a corny question, but I'm interested in the answer nonetheless, Brian. Uh, you know, what would it mean? You mentioned, you know, your relationship there with Katie trying to get him to the Final Four. If this team, I know any team, and they've been so close, has, has Painter and company. If this team could make it to Phoenix to the final four. What is what would that mean to you and a lot of the former players, do you think? Oh, well, yeah. You, know, you know, just you know, getting to the final four. I mean, Purdue has had such a incredible history of basketball, you know, dating back to to Wooden and Rick Mount and and, and all of these legends. Um you know, and 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 the Purdue fan base is you know runs deep and the passion uh, that everybody has, you know, if, if we can get to a final four, it's just, it, it, it would just be an amazing opportunity for, for all of Purdue, right. All, all of the fans, all of the students, all of the alums, um, you know, just to celebrate the university, celebrate the coaches, the players, you know, and, and, you know, man, it would be just awesome. I mean, would it, be, would it be kind of like emotional? Like, I mean, if, if it's if they're in the Elite Eight and they're facing Crane or Tennessee and there's, you know, eight minutes to go and it's 65-65, like you guys are sitting on the edge of your seats, are you not? Oh, 100%. 100%. And, you know, similar, you know, when when uh, I was at that Tennessee game several years ago, I was at the Virginia game several years ago, and, and you know, it's emotional. It's electric. It's awesome. It's, you know, so, just so, so many things kind of, you know, flowing through your body and, and, uh, you know, you're just, you know, there's so much hope with this team, um, you know, and it would be emotional for a variety of levels. Cause, you know, cause the great thing about coach painter is, is, you know, even though he's got his core core players is, you know, the guys one through however, however many on the team this year, you know, he does a great job of, of bringing every former player along with him. And, and that's, that's the beauty of paint. That's the beauty of, of the program and, and, and the staff, you know, we're in it with them. You know, we're not, you know, fortunately sure. we're not, it, 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 you know, it doesn't matter if we make shots that, you know, we don't have to be in great shape. That's, that's the great thing about all that. <laughs> you know, we are, we're, we're a part of this. And he welcomes us back, and and he gives us great access, and 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 he includes us in in things, whether it's the some summer alumni game, or coming back for basketball games. You know, we're in it. We're just not out there training. You know, there's no pressure on us. You know, we're 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 along for the ride, and and we're grateful for for it. Brian, if you could rewrite the birth certificate, which I know is a weird question, <laughs> would you throw Brian janitor? Cardinal Brian custodian Cardinal or Brian citizen Payne Cardinal onto the birth certificate. It's a great question. Uh, well, a great question. You know, I, uh, at the time when I was at Purdue, you know, there was questions whether, whether I was doctoring my, my uh, birth certificate because everybody thought I was there for about 10 years. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I, I would probably go with the custodian, okay. um, you know, but uh, man, I'm, I'm excited for the weekend. I think it's going to be spectacular. All the games have been great, and, and I'm going to be cheering on my Boilers just like everybody else, hoping that they can get her done. 739 Friday night. Uh, it should be quite the scene, certainly in Little Caesars Arena for Boiler Nation up there. You know, Pretty fitting in this run, I guess similar to that one that Brian brought up with Tennessee and Virginia, driving distance certainly for both of those regional sites. We'll see if Purdue can advance to that Final Four coming up in Phoenix. Brian, can't thank you enough for making time for us. Uh, congrats on all the success, and uh, maybe we'll have you on leading into the Final Four if you don't mind. 
Hey, that'd be great. I'm happy to join. Appreciate you guys. That's the one and only Brian Custodian Cardinal right there, as if he could amend the birth certificate on that end. Uh, you imagine partying in <laughs> South Beach to celebrate an NBA final? Oh, goodness. I love that they partied so much in Miami and then went back to Dallas that by day, what do you say, day five, you know, Dirk is, is going to throw out the first pitch and they're still partying. And he said, I got to call it off, man. I got to fly back to Indiana. I got to I got to cleanse my soul. I, I think a large part of the audience <laughs> could relate to that in that, you know, it's the bachelor party and the one guy that goes home and oh, sends yeah. the selfie of him in bed saying, yeah. you guys have fun. I'm going to get the last laugh tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh, goodness. Smart move. I mean, it's, yeah. That's why Brian Carnell yeah. had a hell of a career. You better believe it. And the custodian does sound better than Citizen Payne or the janitor. A little the alliteration yeah, yeah, on the end of that. I, I like that. Yeah. Thank you to Brian Cardinal <laughs> out there who now makes Indianapolis home. His son on that uh, guarantee that made a nice run to the semi-state round in the 3A tournament. We'll talk a little state finals with Greg Rakestraw coming up on Friday. Uh, we'll probably postpone the pop quiz for today. We got to talk a little baseball opening day. I mean, how much? Uh, no offense to Corbin, but Mark's, Shohei Otani Mark's time. not here to well, we pr- gotta ask promote the his Mark Cubs. Would want. Yeah, well, I mean, Corbin's Braves are good. Like, I'm not. I don't need to ask about the Braves. I Someone's know they're going to win the, the East. NL Central. <laughs> somebody does have we'll to. See if the Red somebody legs. does have to win. I pitch in with some buddies for the MLB package. You know, the you, they basically allow, you know. As many logins as, as possible. As many logins as possible. So, you know, this week I was wondering, is that buddy going to send me the password? And sure enough, yesterday the old password got texted me at about 3 o'clock. So that was very nice. Opening day tomorrow, Will Carroll, uh, diehard baseball fan, the injury expert. He's going to join us here coming up. And I bet we'll talk baseball opening day. Everyone knows that soaking wet.
All right, Will Carroll going to join us uh, in about eight, nine minutes or so. He's our injury expert, but, uh, you know, knock on wood, we're having him on to talk some actual baseball. Does he know that, KB? You spoke with him. Does oh, he, yes. Okay, we're yes, going to quiz yes, him about, yes. you know, Benedict Mather and Joel No, no, no. Or we might sneak in like one that. Anthony Richardson question. You see Richardson at the uh, Florida-Colorado game at Gamebridge Fieldhouse doing, over the weekend? Doing the chomp? He was, you know, he, I he was saw humming it, it up. Yes, the he three was. Three-point celebrations, the chop. That was one of the best games of the tournament. It was Florida a good Colorado. game. And Colorado Marquette was great. Yeah, color, you know, people thought Colorado could beat Marquette. That did not happen. Uh, I was sad. I wanted to see that Florida team advance. They had some, they had some late injuries in the season. So, uh, baseball going to be starting. We'll do so without the pretentious Cubs fan, Mark Dykton. And again, just a preview, and I know we had him on yesterday, Jaden Taylor. He will be playing Marquette coming up. That is Friday night of the tournament. So that game will actually be just before the Purdue game. Tomorrow night's slate looks like this. Clemson, Arizona will get things started out west. That is 709. At 739, it'll be San Diego State, UConn. Opposite channels there, CBS and TBS for those two. UConn is a 10.5 point favorite. That game to me feels eerily similar to Alabama, San Diego State from last year. I, I want to okay. say Alabama was a similar favorite. In that one, certainly UConn, a little bit more established from their tournament run. That Alabama team, much younger. And the nightcap, outstanding games. North Carolina, Alabama at 939. Carolina favored by four and a half. And this line has changed a lot. It opened as Illinois as a favorite. Iowa State is now a one and a half point favorite over the Fighting Line. Why do you think that's the case? I, that's a great question. I mean, I, I like both. I like both of those t- uh, teams. I, I had Illinois winning this game and going to the Elite Eight. So yeah, so that's you know the where late, I stand. Late one tomorrow, ten oh nine. The estimated tip time there. Those games in Boston for that UConn region. Yeah, so that'll it's, get it's, things started for the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, coming up tomorrow night. Yeah, it's worth mentioning. Illinois and Iowa State's not going to tip off until ten. 10.30, Brace 10.25, I mean mm-hmm. 10.20, something like that. So, Eastern time, if you're staying up, baby, Corbin, I don't think you're going to be able to stay up for that one. I might have to catch part of that uh, tomorrow. I might have to catch part of that in the morning. All right, so I'm going to go Arizona. I- I'm going to go pretty chalky here until the very end. Arizona, UConn, North Carolina, and then I'm going to go the three over the two. I'll go Illinois over Iowa State just because I I'll had that Bama. in my bracket. Okay. I'll take Bam over okay. Carolina. Okay, um, I was I'll wondering go, if you would vary at all on any of those results. I'll go there, I, and I, I'll take San Diego State to cover on that 10.5. Um, it's a lot they, of points. Yeah, I think they could keep it somewhat interesting. And Purdue fans, for those that care, your tip times this weekend, they should be pretty locked in. Uh, they are locked in, frankly. Uh, 739 on Friday, that's the first game in the arena. So you will tip off at 739 on Friday night. Uh, again, that is from Detroit against Gonzaga, and then if they advance the Elite Eight, that would be either 220 or 505. Of course, that would be Sunday, and that would be the only game in the arena. So some chaos for Purdue this past weekend with their tip times. They will not have that uh, coming up here Friday, and if they advance to Sunday to try to go to the Final Four. I know that Matt Painter was – you know, I remember last uh, Thursday when he had his press conference, he was like, listen, we just want to get out there and play. Like, they probably on that Friday, last Friday, instead of playing at 730, what was it, 730, 745, whenever that game finally went off, that they probably, some of them, maybe even Painter wishes, they would have played much earlier in the day. But for a fan, I, I mean, hasn't it been great, the start times? I mean, you got the Friday night, so, you know, even if you wanted to do a little half day of work, you, you you could have. And still, if you're a couple hours away from Indianapolis, you can come into the town and, you know, have have a bunch of drinks and have some food and hang out with buddies and everything else downtown. And then you play at night. It's not too bad. You get out. It's 10, 15, 10, 30 or whatever. You can celebrate. You hang out Saturday, Sunday. They weren't the late game on, you know, they weren't the late game on, uh, on, on, on Sunday either. And then coming up. Friday, you don't have to play Thursday and do the whole, hey, am I going to go to work? Am I taking days off on Thursday and Friday? Hell, you play Friday night. You play Friday night. Again, it's 7.30, 7.40. Uh, it's been prime time to me. It's been perfect for the Purdue fan to watch their team. Some may disagree with me, but that's the way I see it. I'll sneak in a little baseball on the other side. Opening day coming up tomorrow around Major League Baseball, and certainly the Shohei Otani topic has been uh, quite one that has stirred a lot of interest. We'll chat with one of our favorites. Will Carroll joins us next. 
This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had more time in the day? Nap, read, talk with a friend? When you know what's more important to you, it's easier to...
105.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Last segment of the show. Been a fun show today. Been a busy show today. Appreciate Rick Carlisle joining us. Stephen Holder. Purdue great Brian Cardinal as well. All those conversations along with our guest baggery all up. 1075thefan.com on the podcast center. Uh, final segment. Let's go back on out to the Payless Liquors Hotline. Will Carroll joining us. Now, Will, good morning. Yeah, You know, we've joked. Usually when we have you on, <laughs> it's some sort of injury that's going to hurt one of the local yeah. teams here, okay? And usually people like your voice, but they really don't want to hear it. So uh, it's, right. good, it's good to have you on because KB tells me you're a big baseball guy and so opening day you know the real opening day coming up tomorrow so good morning thank you for joining us I wanted to ask you this just to start things uh what do you make of the Otani mess that the Dodgers are dealing with and that whole saga that's been going on for about a week now yeah you know the the thing is I don't understand it yet you know this is a, a complicated story one that really surrounds our entire relationship with sports and I think people are, are thrown by it. You know, when you think of gambling, you think of Pete Rose and how wrong he was in doing what he did and the reasons he's still banned from baseball. But yet at the same time, you've got – you guys have ads, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, uh, for FanDuel, for DraftKings, for sure. wh- whichever ones they are. Uh, and it's really taken over. ESPN has their own sports book. Uh, so how do they cover this story? Uh, it complicates things, but there's just so many questions. You know, we don't know anything about Otani. We didn't even know he got married until he, you know, threw an Instagram post out there. Um, you know, what was this guy betting on? How did he have access to the accounts? How do you have $4.5 million you don't even know you're missing? Uh, I'd like to find that out. Uh, so it's, it's a story about a guy we don't know anything about. What was this guy theoretically betting on, that he was so bad that there was $4.5 million down? And then to make it even more interesting, uh, I was on radio with someone else that didn't really understand the story any better, and they were like, well, why is it, why is it a problem? I mean, gambling's legal. I was like, not in California. It's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is part of a federal <laughs> investigation and money laundering and the rest. We have a, you know, We get all these commercials. It's been a, a big part of our lives. Uh, but yet it's not legal in the two biggest states. So it's, it's still a complex thing that we haven't come to terms with. Well, one more on the Otani front from me, and I think you kind of hinted at it with your answer there, but if you could give true serum to Otani or the interpreter on one question, getting one answer, what would it be? Um, man, that's a, that's a tough one because there's so many questions on this. I mean, first, I'd like to know what they were betting on. You know, if you're betting on baseball, it's a far different story than if you're just really bad at betting on, I don't know, basketball props. Um, So, yeah, that's the one. Is is this a baseball story or is this a gambling story? All right, shifting gears here to opening day for Major League Baseball. Will Carroll, the injury expert, you can find him on Twitter. He joins us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. I think most of our baseball fans reside here in the NL Central. It is an extremely competitive division if you look at the (laughs) over-unders for this season. Starts with the Cardinals at 84 and a half and goes to the Pirates at 75 and a half. Sandwich the Cubs, the Reds, and Brewers in between there. Who do you think wins the Central? I think it's going to be the Cubs. And I think this is the year that we find out just how much a manager is worth. Obviously, the Cubs went out and took Craig Council. Uh, you know, Tom Ricketts decided he was going to uh, you know, fight off Steve Cohen and outbid him. Um, you know, taking him from a division rival, so it hurt the Brewers a little bit. Pat Murphy takes over, coming up from bench coach, so they basically kept the band together, absent counsel. He didn't take a lot of people with him, which surprised a lot of people. So I think the Cubs are just – this whole division, you, you say competitive, I say mediocre. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mediocrely <laughs> competitive? <laughs> yeah, there might not be – what would you say, 84 was the over on the Cardinals? Right. I, I think it's all going to be right at 500. You can throw a blanket on these teams. I actually think the Pirates are going to be better than people think. We're going to get – you know, do not wait – because Paul Skeens is not going to be in Indianapolis long. And the quicker he's up, the better that team is going to be. There might not be five better pitchers in baseball right now, let alone five better pitchers on the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, 
So you can throw a blanket over all of them at 81. Uh, I, I would not be stunned to see this in complete chaos at the end of the season. And I think having a great manager like Craig Council makes the difference. And I think the Cardinals missed the playoffs because they didn't have that. Will Carroll with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline on the fan on this Wednesday. So, you know, I've been strolling through this morning other times because uh, I like baseball as well, Will. And, you know, uh, you look at the American League East, so stay with me here. Uh, I would mm-hmm. say the overwhelming majority of experts still have the Orioles. If you look yeah. at the Central, I would say it's a little bit jumbled with the Twins. A couple dot, you know, I mean, I think that's the most competitive, quite frankly. You know, the Tigers could win, the Twins, the Guardians. So I think there's three, four teams there that could fight. But the rest are very chalky. You know, I go to the, the AL West. It's the Astros. I go to the NL East. We know it's the Atlanta Braves. We've talked about the Central. Overwhelmingly, people do have experts, have the Cubs. You mentioned them as well. And then, of course, in the NL West, uh, we have the Dodgers. I don't know. You tell me if there was a division winner that wouldn't go chalk, where do you think that would be? Um, I, there, there are two. First, I think the, the AL West is not going to go as people think. I don't think Houston's going to be as good. Um, you know, I've had my issues with Dusty Baker in my day, but I, I think he was a very good manager and at his best with the Astros. He learned as he went along, which is not what you usually see. Uh, so I think there's going to be a small drop down with new management. Uh, we'll see how they do. We'll see whether Justin Verlander's very secretive shoulder issue is a bigger deal. Uh, I think Texas is going to go back. I think they may well be in the World Series again. They are a better team than they were last year. Uh, the playoffs are a crapshoot. So uh, all you have to do is get there and something good can happen. I also think everybody's sleeping on Seattle. I think Seattle has so much pitching, so much more coming that they're going to be good. And in the AL East, I like Toronto a lot. I think that's going to be a very, very good division. I think Baltimore is the most talented team, but they can't get out of their own way. They've got as much talent uh, going to Norfolk in AAA than they do than most teams do in their entire minor leagues. So collect all that talent for the years they've been tanking. Get a new owner who can put big money at it. Uh, but you know, get out of your own way and play the talent once you have it. Uh, they've got to figure that out. I think Toronto is loaded. Uh, you know, Vladimir Guerrero is going to get paid big time starting next year. Uh, and uh, But this year is the one where I think he puts up numbers and reminds us <clears throat> he might be the best hitter in the family. Again, Will Carroll, the injury expert, right there on the Payless Liquors Hotline as we get to opening day coming up tomorrow in Major League Baseball. Will, as always, man, great stuff. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, April 2nd will be opening day over at Victory Field. Okay. For I was the wondering. Indians. They will open up on the road in Louisville coming up starting on Friday. And shout out to one of our favorites. We've had him on, of course, uh, Tucker Barnhart, uh, making the Diamondbacks opening day roster. Arizona team certainly lurking in the NL West. That will be year 11. Tucker Barnhart. Good for uh, him. Sounds like winning Good for job him. number two, uh, catcher job number two there behind. Gabriel Moreno in Arizona. So uh, the run continues. Hell of a career for Tucker Barnhart now in year 11. Thank you to Rick Carlisle, Stephen Holder, Brian Cardinal, and Will Carroll. Tomorrow, Rick Venturi for an hour starting at 7.30, 40-year anniversary of the move. We'll talk Colts present day as well. Cannot wait for that. Basketball wasn't born in Indiana. but. It-